Good evening and welcome to this first meeting of Burnside Council for 2020. Happy New Year to you all, to all residents, ratepayers and the staff and the elected members. I have already said Happy New Year to you, but I'll reiterate that as well. Could you please all stand now for the acknowledgements? We acknowledge that the land that we meet on today is the traditional land of the Ghana people and that we respect their spiritual relationship with their country. We also acknowledge the Ghana people as the custodians of the Adelaide region and that their cultural and heritage beliefs are still important to the Ghana people today. We also pay respect to the cultural authority of Aboriginal people visiting and attending from other areas of South Australia and Australia. On behalf of the City of Burnside, I gratefully acknowledge and pay respect to those who have sacrificed their lives for this country and its people. We pray for understanding and guidance as in our debate as we make decisions that will impact on the lives of all who reside, study, work in or visit the city of Burnside. Grant us wisdom as we serve our community. Tonight, we also recognise and thank all those heroes who have served their communities across Australia in the recent bushfires. And I ask you to remain standing while we observe a minute's silence to honour those who lost their lives in those devastating bushfires. Thank you, and please be seated. For the observers in the gallery, I welcome you all and ask you to observe in respectful silence as those in the chamber deliberate on matters that relate to the city of Burnside. Should there be a fire or any other emergency, the alarm will sound and you are asked to follow instructions of the council staff. I remind you that all council meetings are live streamed through the council's website and a copy of the agenda is also available by downloading it from this website. I remind elected members to use their microphones appropriately so that those at home can hear the debate clearly. And finally, please turn off your mobile, phone, mobile phones or switch them to silent. We have no apologies, but I do seek leave of the meeting to receive a leave of absence request from Councillor Davey. It is on med medical grounds for tonight's meeting only. I'd like an indication of whether you support that uh, leave of absence, please. Thank you. Approved. Confirmation of minutes, that the minutes of the ordinary meeting of this council held on December 20, uh, 10th of 2019 be taken as read and confirmed. Is there a motion? Sorry? Oh, sorry, we have to move and second the leave of absence. Uh, apology. Um, my apology. Okay, so I can have a mover. Councillor Davis, seconded. Councillor Lemon. Uh, those in favour? Against. Carried. Now moving on to confirmation of minutes. That the minutes of the ordinary meeting of council held on the 10th of December be taken as read and confirmed. Councillor Davis, thank you. Moved, seconded by <laughs> Councillor um, Hughes. Thank you. Um, deputations. We have Two deputations today. Motion. Sorry, motion. I didn't. I'm, I'm forgetting to put the motion. <laughs> I'm getting lost of practice. Okay, those in favour, those against, carried. And I'm also forgetting to use that. Okay, deputations. We have two today. First of all, Mr. Tony Pike, related to Amberwoods Estate Speed Limit and Traffic Control. If you'd like to come forward into the centre chair here, Mr. Pike. No, no, sit down, please, <laughs> please, please sit down. 
No. <laughs> please, please sit down, and if you, there's water there if you, if you need it as well. Um, you have five minutes from when we tell you to start. Okay. <laughs> well, and the, there is, for the formality for the boys that are going to follow, I might as well say it once and then they will hear it too. You have a warning bell at four minutes, and then you have another minute to sum up after that first four minutes. Okay. So, over to you, but before you start, there's a button in front of you that says speak. Could you press that, please? Right. We've done the rounds in Amberwood's estate, and we have a petition that, that council has that's been signed by many, and the idea or the thrust behind it is to have a speed limit in Amberwood's estate being Plane Tree Drive and Cedar Crescent, the speed limit being 40 kilometres an hour. Um, kids play in the park, balls run onto roadways, kids chase them, um, and also they ride bikes. Cedar Crescent particularly is a lane more than a, a roadway. It's, uh, you'd hardly call it a road. Um, cars that park on one side limit, limit uh, access. So we feel that it's be it would be a good idea, common sense, to have a speed limit of 40. At the moment, it's 50. Um, as I've, Cedar Crescent is, is, and Plain Tree Drive are avenues that resemble laneways other than roads. Now, taking into account that the PTSD hospital, which is directly behind Amberwoods, has a speed limit of 40 kilometres an hour now. now the visibility in the roads in there are more open and uh, if they have a speed limit of 40, we can't see why the narrow little area that we live in uh, doesn't also have a speed limit of 40. Um, uh, there, there, there are two junctions that are of particular importance. The junction between um, Plain Tree Drive and Cedar Crescent that near, near house number one and also a little bit further on, there are corners where people uh, tend to drive and because they don't slow down, they cut the corners. And it's, it's, it's very, you have to be very particular about watching. And if there's trees, you can't see around the corners. Even 40 is pushing it, but we'll go for 40. Um, we need to slow that traffic down uh, and keep the area calm. A lot of people do drive at 40, but a lot don't, particularly um, pea platers that are always in a hurry, and uh, not all drivers are sensible, and not always all drivers drive to the conditions that th that area commands. Um, it may it it, the, it needs to be made official by signage at the entrance to Plain Tree Drive. W it would be sensible to put a sign up that says 40, exactly the same as the sign that you see when you enter the PTSD hospital from going down Am 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 Amberwoods Drive. So when you hit that, when you get to that, what was the gate to the old hospital, which is now the entrance to that new area where all the development's going on, there's a sign that says 40. Now coming the other way, if cars come out of there, the back of that sign says 50. Now that gives people the licence to do 50. Now if they happen to turn right into Plain Tree Drive, the speed limit's still 50. So it'd be sensible to have a sign at the entrance to Plain Tree Drive to make people aware that, that, it's, that the speed limit should, should be monitored and to drive at a sensible speed. Uh, I think I've covered, I've covered all that. I've made a point here that health and safety are prominent, uh, is a, have a prominent role in society and in industry in general. And to keep traffic calm in there would be a sensible move. Uh, really, the, the petition speaks for itself. Um, there are many signatures on it. Um, council has the petition. Um, and can I mention that once before we asked for this and we got a letter here back from the previous CEO Paul Deb, uh, and it said, without reading it to you, uh, he has acknowledged that a speed limit, a speed limit of 40, is more than likely to be approved. But 
that was not that was his opinion. <laughs> yes. Uh, well, we tried for this once before, and, and it never got through. So we, we've had kids. I've, I've seen kids that, that, that shoot out from the rotunda area, and there's a, there's a pathway there that's, that, that that invites spikes and and Cedar Crescent being a little well brick paved laneway. I'd hate to see anyone knocked over, especially when cars come around the first corner, which is a blind corner. So, so I really haven't got any more to say about it. Um, thanks for coming in. I just had a question. You said that they were cut through traffic, so off Cottingham Street, Amberwoods Drive. Where would they be going, like past the traffic from Cottingham Street? Has, that goes into the PTSD hospital down, right. uh, down um, uh, Amberwoods Drive. Okay. Um, passes on the left just before it enters a Cedar uh, Plain Tree Drive. Now, they're doing 50 by law, but legally they can do 50 down Amberwoods Drive. So if they happen to turn left into Plain Tree Drive, the, the speed limit's still 50. Okay, so they're mainly going to that hospital. They would, but since the new development in there, we've had a lot of people looking around. There's over 100 houses in that area, and there's development that's come at the back. Um, Two-storey townhouses, which, is, which has made the area a lot more dense, yep. and there's a lot more traffic. Okay. So. And what would be the flow of the traffic? How many... I mean, you haven't done it. The flow you of haven't traffic counted them, but... On Amberwoods Drive... How many would you say in a day? Well, we've got the PTSD hospital. We've got a thoroughfare now through, right through to Fullerton Road, because there's traffic lights at Fullerton Road now. So people yep. can take a cut through there. It's the traffic flows increase, but that's not the area we live in. That's not the little park area. That's that bypasses um, Plain Tree Drive. Yeah. Because of this new development, we get a lot more cars in there, a lot more people looking around. Houses for sale. Um, a lot of people are not aware of it. We, we've noticed a lot more traffic, particularly at night. Cars, <coughs> young, there's young people, families have moved in with, with young people, and they've all got two or three cars per house. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Carvalho. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, I hope you don't mind, actually, Your Worship, but I sometimes do occasionally refer to Tony as the unofficial mayor of Amber Woods. Not to take too much away from you, I hope. So, but, uh, but Tony, I just wanted to also thank you for coming in tonight and just to publicly thank you for all your work that you've been doing. I know getting these 75 signatures took a long time, you and your wife, and I just wanted to acknowledge the amount of work that uh, you and your wife have been doing. I have received a few phone calls from residents who have been very appreciative of you knocking on their door and, and doing what you're doing, so thank you um, as, again. I just wanted to ask, 75 signatures, a lot of work, that's virtually everyone in Amber Woods. We think we have, yes. Yeah, just, just, a, just a question I have to ask, and I, this may sound a bit silly, but was there anyone who said, anyone at all, who said no and didn't sign it? I never, we never received one negative response. If people that, that have never seen us before or didn't know us that looked at us through the screen door and were a bit suspicious of who we might be, religious canvases or whatever that was, they opened the door and welcomed us as soon as we announced our purpose. So no, we, we weren't knocked back by anybody. So it was unanimous. Unanimous. Can I make? A, can I just say something? It's not. We, we have a history of road safety, and on our wall at home we have the Premier's Award for community service connected to road safety. My wife and I started the Adelaide Hills Road Safety Group as an as an offshoot from the Catholic Church's um, um, a parish nurse. My wife and her friend Julie Brooks started the Adelaide Hills Road Safety Group because kids were killing themselves up there in cars out in the bush at night. And as a, as a consequence of that first road safety group, all the council areas in the hills and country had a road safety group and it got big enough for the government to appoint a full-time officer named Mercedes Harrelham to coordinate the road safety groups. Now we, we bailed out because I retired from my business in 2007. I'm not sure what, what's happening now, but um, we're a bit conscious of road safety. Thank you for that. Thank you for that. And Councillor Piggott, you were there, but you're not anymore. Oh, sorry. 
No, I'll have to wait now. Uh, Councillor Dawes. Uh, Tony, uh, I'm over here. Thank you. Hello. How are you? Uh, Amber Woods Drive. All right. Now, you haven't said that should be 40 kilometres per hour. You've talked about the start of... Is it Plain? Just trying to... Plain Tree Drive Plain and Drive. Cedar. Yeah. Uh, have you got a view of the other part? Yes, because that's I do. Yeah. But Could I didn't you... want to push our luck because we're yeah. asking for a speed limit in Cedar Crescent and Plain Tree Drive. But certainly, now that you've raised it, Amber Woods Estate, <laughs> Amber Woods Drive would be the very best starting point at the corner of, Co of Conningham Street because of the flow through traffic. You've got a, the first junction you've got is uh, Plain Tree Drive, and then you've got the entrance to the PTSD hospital. And as I've said, coming the other way, it's 50. So if council wanted to widen the scope of this a little bit, it would be certainly a good idea to have 40 in that area as well. Thank you. Councillor Pickett, you not, not there anymore, so... No. OK. All right, I just wanted to add that not only that, you've also got the art school, uh, yeah. South, the um, Adelaide Central School of Art, and the South Australian Film Corporation in sure. that block as well, yeah, that sure, people sure. are going in through the back entrance That's right. as an alternative to going in off Fullerton exactly. Road. But as I said, I didn't want to push our luck. <laughs> and and uh, can I make just one other, now that we've got outside of that little area, the, the, the entrance to the, what is now Southern Cross Homes, the roadway there and Amberwoods Drive, there's only a few feet between them and it creates a lot of confusion. So to reduce the speed limit in Amberwoods Drive as well would take some of the heat off that, that those two, well, they're re really roads, although officially it's a driveway. It would take the heat off that, that point where all the cars seem to meet. Right, well, thank you very much, Mr Pike, for your deputation. Thank you. Now we have uh, two young men, Henry Brill-Reed and Archie McEwen, who are going to talk to us about busking. Please come forward and you now know the system. And I'll turn my microphone. Do they have to have them? I need some guys. Do they have to have them one at a time or do they both operate at the same time? They operate at the same time, do they, Barry? Right. You know the understand what you have to do now, so you're going to take it in turns. I'll leave it to you, you for the five minutes. Is that going to be sufficient for both of you? Okay. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Henry Brewery. This is my good friend Archie McEwen, West Saxburg. Um, Saxburg was formed two years ago to bring joy of the Saxburg into the suburbs, thus the name. A few months ago, we were busking illegally around Burnside Village when Councillor Julian Carbone approached us, excited at the prospect of changing the live music scene in Burnside through busking. We were busking because we had had enough of playing for our own ears in our rooms at home, dwelling on scales, chords, songs, techniques. There comes a point where you ask yourself, can I share this with other people? You spend so much time that you feel you, have to, uh, you deserve to entertain. The only thing stopping us, we were only 13 and 14 and certainly not professionals. That's when we started busking. The amount of people that would walk past and smile or comp compliment us was incredible. The people of Burnside were enjoying it. They were enjoying our illegal music. And, <laughs> and so were we. We loved playing for the community. We loved the pressure of it all. We loved seeing the happiness of the people watching and listening. For a few weekends, we felt like rock stars. Eventually, we applied for a permit for the city and moved on to busking in Rundle Mall. Tonight, though, should not be about the success of the past, but rather the opportunities created by the new initiative to all the young musicians working tirelessly to perfect their craft. The public cannot hear them as they practice behind closed doors, but hopefully now they'll be able to entertain and energize the community while simultaneously turning the city of Burnside into an innovative and fun area. The city of Burnside is focused on placemaking and we cannot think of a better way to create and activate a community space and place rather th uh, by filling it than, uh, with music. We would like to note that in the suggested permit found in the agenda for this meeting, the exact day and time of the busking is requested. We firmly believe that the permit should be more like the free permit for the city of Adelaide, which once approved gives the busker a whole month of busking before a new permit must be applied for. We believe the current suggested permit may de deter people like who, like, who are like us and cannot be certain regarding the exact time they will be busking. 
Busking is like shopping. It is not an exact science, but more a spontaneous pursuit. Furthermore, if people have to request a permit every single time, this will put a lot of stra strain on the council to approve or disapprove each one, unlike a monthly permit. Finally, we as experienced buskers disagree with condition 20.7 which states that buskers are to receive written support from owners of a business outside which a performance is being held. This not only overcomplicates and extends the process for the performer, but involves the effort of businesses, who from our own experience know little about the busking rules in our area. We think that with the proposed changes, you either fully embrace the busker in Burnside, or you miss the chance to activate the positive outcomes. Busking at a place like Burnside Village achieves the goal of keeping the site as a destination whilst the redevelopments are in progress. Moreover, it connects the community with local schools and music groups. So in summary, allowing busking permits just in time for the fringe is a low-risk, low-cost initiative with significant community and place-making benefits. It is highly correlated with the City Burnside strategic plan provisions of creating a vibrant, diverse, resilient, happy, healthy and connected community with a strong sense of belonging and well-being. Music is a proven vehicle to achieve the important objective of improving the quality of life for a community. Other councils have implemented successful schemes such as City of Adelaide. We would sincerely like to thank Julian Carbone, who has not only swiftly proposed fantastic changes to live music in Burnside, but also supported a happier, more vibrant community. Thank you to everyone for listening, and we hope that we have provided helpful information, infected you with our enthusiasm for our craft, and convinced you to help us share our music. Thank you. Thank you very much. Councillor Carbone, you wish to ask a question? This never happens. Thank you, Your Worship. I've got to say, I was uh, I was impressed when I first met these uh, these two gentlemen, and now I'm even more impressed because you you know you added rock stars and you mentioned rock stars and so forth. You, you can now add public speaking to your resume. So, well done. I just wanted to say congratulations on being um, pioneers in the city of Burnside for all you've achieved over the last couple of months. You were the catalyst for all of this. <laughs> And, uh, and I think you've done a, a fantastic job. I have been watching your, uh, your group on Facebook. I know you've been going to the Adelaide City Council, you know, that, that other council down the road. Uh, we'd like to, keep, of course, keep you right here in Burnside. It's where you both live, in Glenside and Dulwich and so forth. So uh, my question to you is um, now, you know, given that it's all about numbers and, and so forth, what are your thoughts on busking outside, say, the Burnside Pool during summer? Uh, the library on you know, weekends and so forth, and maybe the the Glenunga Hub, you know, Web Oval, on uh, you know on football days and cricket days and so forth. What, what what are your thoughts on those those three locations? I think it's I think it's interesting because you could really list a hundred places in Burnside, and I don't think for any of them you could imagine there being consequences. You know, you you I picture when you said by Burnside Pool in Hazelwood Park, I I just should say myself there and uh, and all I could think of is what if the player was bad but <laughs> if if you walked past someone who wasn't maybe uh, up to a high standard you wouldn't think in your mind they're shocking this is terrible you think at least they're having a go so I just I don't see any consequences for any places in Burnside. <laughs> Councillor Hubel. I've got it again. I'm 
touch anything. <laughs> no, I haven't touched. I haven't touched it. Yes, I've been told to leave it on. Yes, please continue. Uh, there's a spot just outside, there's a little car park and there's an end where you first found this actually and in front of the sign because you get a lot of flow from people parking their cars going in to grab a quick bit of shopping and then coming out and then watching us. Yeah. If we, I feel like we would prefer to go in Burnside, like on the property of Burnside, but we got kicked out there the first time. Yeah. So <laughs> it didn't end well. Yeah. Mm, yeah, we learned the hard way. The experts are on it. Councillor Hubel, you're next to speak. So. Okay. Um, guys, uh, very impressive, very young, and um, congratulations for um, coming out here with this class of people coming to pull down the historic site for everyone. Um, I really like how you talk about uh, spontaneous pursuit um, proposing, so I mean, activating a positive outcome. Um, and I'd be really interested in, um, as we go forward, to try and actually, you know what, I'll leave it to you to try and come up with some sort of imagination. I did want to ask you um, what areas of Burnside do you think would be best for having Dustin you know, um, come to the arms of individuals or any other places, or if you could you know, imagine a place within the city that you think oh, wouldn't it be great if it, you know, this location had it and then we can say we have this place where we can have a live event and then you know, the sign is there. What, what would those places be? Well, similar to how I answered that one, places like you know shopping centres where you get a lot of flow of people who may not be from that area, most of the time it is, but you get a lot of flow of people coming in and spending money, obviously. Um, but often it's not really a great environment and because people aren't in a great mood, you know, they've got to get food, they've got to get home, make dinner, etc. Um, and so busking places like that really kind of lift it, lifts the vibe and I feel like that'd be the best place. I might just add Glenunga Hub because you put so much time, effort and money into such a great building, why not make it even better with something that's free? <laughs> <laughs> Guys, thank you very much. Councillor Piggott. I was... Uh, yeah, thanks for, thanks for coming in. That last comment was absolutely gold. You, uh, you have got a future in politics, I assure you. The, um, um, I was interested in what you were saying about the perfect permit, the permit that we're currently looking at doesn't quite work. So you, I just wanted to clarify what you were saying in terms of you would like a permit to operate anywhere in the city of Burnside for a month or... Is that, is that how it works in Adelaide or... So perhaps how does it work in Adelaide? You've obviously got one for Adelaide. So Hopefully, that, or is yeah. it illegal there too? <laughs> <laughs> All right. So Adelaide, it's pretty, they've made it really straightforward so that yeah. anybody who's willing to bus can pick it up, which is why you get some not particularly amazing buskers in London Wall. Um, moving on. Uh, so <laughs> pe people who go onto the website, right, you, you go onto City of Adelaide website, you get a form similar to the one we saw on your agenda. Mm. Um, you fill out your name, put in uh, obviously parent, parent like signature, uh, and then you, you choose your starting date and your end date, you get a month, and then any time within that month in daylight hours, unless you're an adult, right? Um, you can pick any time, any day within that month, and then you can go anywhere in Adelaide that isn't you know, private property, uh, and you can bust there. Great, okay. So, and as a follow-up on that, just on the parent, your parents have to, if you're under 18, uh, have to um, sign off on the application, but they don't have to be there listening to you play. Yeah, no. is that how that works? Yeah. So you're, you're once, responsible on the day. Yeah. Once there. they've signed off uh, off on us, we'll go out for a day and we'll spend the day there without parents or anything. We'll you know, get lunch there, do some busking. Yeah, it's all independent. Excellent. Thank you. Councillor Davis. So. Good one, Matt. We're good. All right. 
Thanks for coming in. Um, so yeah, my, I guess my question is around, you had two concerns, one asked by Councillor Piggott, and the other concern was the time slot issue. Um, how does it work in Rundle Moor where you have, you know, they're generally evenly spaced and they have locations along Rundle Moor that they're, how does it work there? Like, I, I can't imagine that you have two buskers come in and, and I've seen them compete, I suppose, and go bad. And in Norwood we were, we talked to a councillor about how their permit system worked and they had time slots, so they'll, you request and they give you a time slot. How does it work? Uh, so when we go to Rundle, there are half an hour slots and uh, it's, it's very courteous actually, is a lot of respect. Basically, you play for half an hour and then you have to move a minimum of 50 metres away. Uh, right. There's already pretty much set spots, but within 50 metres, you can't be heard. So if we, often we can't get a spot because as you, you say, you might worry about it being competitive. A lot of buses come and it's true. We often have to wait, but we just sit there. Maybe halfway through, we'll ask how long we're going to be and then maximum will be 20 minutes, 25 minutes. Okay. And then we get that spot. Okay. It's never an issue. Okay, so you don't foresee, yeah, because as a councillor, we've got to try and prevent problems. Yeah, and my, I guess my two biggest problems is that you have owners with outdoor seating or dining areas going, well, you're not that good and you're scaring <laughs> off all my customers. And then you've got, because I would do it totally if I was a young child. <laughs> then you make them essentially, and you sit there and you, you hassle them until you get the money. And if they don't want you there, and then the second issue is for me scheduling if you have multiple people in the same spot. So, but you reckon it'll be fine? I'd, I'd say scheduling. If you just wrote something like half an hour, 40 minutes maximum in one spot, uh, and then you have to move a minimum of 50 metres, it solves that problem. Okay. And then so that then in itself encourages other people to, one, find a better spot, or two, wait. <laughs> okay. So in on page, whatever it is, of our 148, you'd say, I don't know if you have it, but get rid of the call is five, and then get rid of the... Um, the slot provision and then replace it with you can busk in a location for a maximum of 30 minutes before you must move 50 metres away I, it's pretty much perfect I'd say maybe 50 minutes or, or almost an hour because it's a bit more busy in London Mall. I wouldn't expect so much competition in Burnside yeah. so probably yeah, yeah you might yeah, shut down the market now <laughs> we'll see I'd, uh, I might get out my violin <laughs> yeah <laughs> It's terrible. Don't do it. I can definitely see people not, not wanting to play my violin. All right, thank you for coming. Might have to take Okay, thank, thank you, boys. Um, Adelaide is the UNESCO city of music. And uh, I consider that, that it spreads beyond just the city of Adelaide. There's worldwide recognition as a UNESCO city. There are three creative cities in Australia that bear the badge. One for music, which is Adelaide. Sydney has um, film and Melbourne has theatre, I think it is. So um, I may be wrong about that last one, but I think the more that we can spread music and delight people, even if they don't like the music and we don't all like all kinds of music, I think it's a great opportunity for us as the listeners, but more importantly, for emerging musicians and singers who, are, who, who may one day be out there getting Grammys. So all the best. Thank and thank you for coming. We have one petition. Uh, could I have a mover for that on page... Uh, Councillor Cornish, moving it. Do you wish to speak? Councillor Lemon, you're seconding. Thank Do you, you wish to speak? No. Okay, so... All those in favour? Against? Carried. Thank you. Now, uh, I'm not aware of any questions for public question time. Questions on no... Oh, sorry, you have one. Sorry. Please come forward, Mr Allison. Thank you. Sorry, I thought you may have just been here with the group from about Laurel Avenue. Just to state your name and not your full address, just your suburb. Sorry. And turn your microphone on. Okay. Uh, my name is Steve Allison. I live in Linden Park. Um, yes, I am here with the group tonight. Um, and I have a question related to the BRM advisory 
business case, which is on the agenda tonight, which recommends a community garden as the best option for the community land at Laurel Avenue. And I'm seeking clarification around the monitoring of green urban environment in Lyndon Park and the surrounding suburbs. Um, one of the strongest rationales for a community garden in the suburbs around Lyndon Park is development intensity. Uh, there's a great deal of urban infill, there's new housing on that's being built smaller and taller. So in other words, two-storey dwellings on smaller blocks with um, minimal trees and gardens. Um, that uh, makes residents more likely to gather in community green spaces to grow herbs, fruit, vegetables, all the kinds of things we, we like to do in community gardens. Um, now, my specific question. In 2015, Seed Consulting undertook a survey of the loss of trees and gardens across the city of Burnside. Um, the study found that the suburbs near the proposed community garden had the least um, trees and gardens across the city. So Eastwood was in fact the most built up, uh, followed by closely by Gen Glenside, Fruville, Linden Park, and even uh, Dulwich and Rose Park had considerably less trees and gardens than average for the city. So the picture is towards the west, there's a great loss of trees and gardens. So my specific question, given the uh, declaration of a climate emergency in uh, the city of Burnside, does the council have access to data from the last five years? The previous report was five years ago. Um, does the council have data measuring the loss of trees and gardens in the suburbs surrounding 31 Laurel Avenue and the effects on particularly nighttime temperatures? And if not, could the council um, uh, gain access to, uh, to that kind of data? Thank you, Mr Allison. I'll defer this one to... Thanks for the question. Um, I believe the last um, version of the Canopy Action Plan calls for um, those uh, surveys uh, and it's taken through um, aerial photography um, to look at the uh, uh, loss or gain of canopy throughout the city. Um, we're actually undertaking that this financial year um, that we're updating that. We're expecting those figures to inform um, future iterations of Canopy Action Plan uh, and council strategy within the next financial year. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Allison. Uh, are there any questions on notice? Any motions on notice? Questions without notice? Motions without notice? Reports of officers? Um, there is a presentation, first of all, from the Audit Committee Independent Chairperson, um, Mr. David Powell. Uh, David, I'd like you to come forward to the, to the seat. Um, and while David's doing that, um, is it, I would like a, a sort of direction from the, from the uh, council as to whether you would approve us moving forward the debate about Laurel Avenue to the next item after Mr Powell has spoken. Uh, I need a, an indication from you all as to whether you support that. Thank you very much. We will do that so that your, the audience know that you'll be up next. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Powell. Thanks, Mayor Monso. Um, my name is David Powell, and I think my challenge tonight is how do I make talking about an audit committee as exciting as young buskers? <laughs> I think. But um, it is. Uh, I'm pleased to provide you with my uh, third presiding members report uh, um, for the audit committee for 2019. We met on six occasions during 2019, considered a range of uh, topics under our terms of reference. Um, we've got a responsibility uh, under the Local Government Act in relation to the general purpose financial statements and we met with external auditors, Dean Newberries, um, during the, uh, the process and they issued an unqualified audit opinion on the financial statements and the internal controls. And in our October meeting, um, the committee resolved that we're satisfied with the financial statements 
if they present fairly the state of affairs of the council for the year ended the 30th June 2019 and we forwarded it for your consideration and ultimate adoption. We've also reviewed financial statements for the four regional subsidiaries, East Waste, um, Eastern Health Authority, uh, Highbury Landfill and Hero Water. And uh, certainly want to acknowledge the work of the finance team in preparing the accounts. A lot of work goes into preparing financial statements and we uh, acknowledge the work of, of that team. Um, a number of other topics that we covered during the year, uh, looking at um, uh, the policy protocol tracking table, so the tracking of policies. Uh, we reviewed the annual uh, business plan and budget, um, the financial, uh, periodical financial results of the subsidiaries, the annual report, uh, the financial statements of the subsidiaries, and the um, annual business plan and budget timetable. And um, internal controls, we, we look at the self-assessment that's conducted, uh, and we play an active role in the work with the internal auditor in reviewing their internal audit plan. The internal audit reports, we had three this year, on the um, cyber risk assessment done by the local government risk services, one on legislative compliance and customer experience centres. Um, we also uh, have been active in reviewing or uh, getting involved with service reviews. Uh, so we received service reviews on street cleaning, uh, the Eastern Health Authority service cost review and uh, a street verge maintenance review. We've reviewed policies on the sale and disposal of assets, fees and charges, entertainment, hospitality and emergency management. Uh, and obviously work with the external auditors around their uh, audit management letters and actions to be taken by administration and review their independence. Uh, we do continue to have the um, representatives from the regional subsidiaries come and present to the audit committee uh, on what they consider their key risks and financial challenges. And there certainly have been some of those over the year. Uh, and we also get involved with reviewing the risk register, uh, work health and safety, uh, section 270 reviews, uh, have a good look at active, the asset management plans, and then do a self-assessment of our own work. So I'd certainly like to uh, thank Mayor Monso, uh, Councillor Hemsky, Councillor Jones, and uh, independent members Roberto Bria, who retired in September, and Stephen Coates for their valued contribution to the committee. And certainly look forward to working with you again in the next year. I'm happy to take any questions if anyone does have any. Councillor Dawes. Hi, Hi David. Um, welcome back. I noticed Thank you uh, received a presentation from Eastern Health and the Brown Hill Keswick Street Storm Water. Mm -hmm. um, are you doing an era water? presentation or are you going to receive an era water presentation this year? Um, I think it would be back on the agenda. Um, we, we typically, it's February, th there you go. I haven't seen the, the um, papers yet, but what we, we will do is um, cycle through each of the region's subsidiaries during the year. So over those six meetings, at least four, four of those meetings will have an individual representative um, from those meetings. So we, we do have them in February. Right. Have you got a view about the ongoing um, viability of era water or is that a, a too tough a question for you? It's probably a tough question to ask without notice. Um, look, there is, there's obviously a lot of work going on in relation to looking at the viability of, of era water and, and, and we are, I believe we are waiting on some reports on to that effect. Can you help me on that one, Martin? Or do we have any reports coming around era water financial viability? Yes, through the chair, uh, we've recently had a meeting with uh, the chair and the general manager. Right. That was the CEOs of the three constituent councils and relevant staff. And I believe um, Brian Jenkins confirmed that at the end of February, they'll be presenting a report on that strategy. So we, we would expect to see that coming up, but I, I certainly wouldn't have an opinion specifically about the viability without seeing some of those reports. Thank you, Dave. Thanks, Mike. Right, there are, there are no other names on the screen, so no is there anyone who wishes to move this, please? That the report be received? Councillor Cornish? Yep. Thank you. And seconded by Councillor Henschke, you had your hand up before you, instead of seeing the microphone. <laughs> so um, I'll take those as a mover and seconder. And anyone who wishes to speak on that? Thank you. Those in favour? Carried. Thank you, Mr Powell, for coming in and presenting. Thank you, ma'am.
agreed down to 13.8, page 133, the business case and options for Laurel Avenue, Linden Park site. And I have Harvey Jones on the screen already. Can we just make a slight change, please? Uh, can you delete four? Um, and then the new four becomes current usage of the Laurel Avenue and Tamarack Avenue made roads. Do you, need, do you want me to read it out, Mayor? Or, okay. That Council receive and note the report to commence community engagement on the community garden option in order to ter determine support for community garden in this location. The numbers of people interested in participating in and accessing a community garden and to gauge interest in being involved in the design stage of community garden alongside professional landscape architects. Three, be presented with a report with the results of this consultation before commencing the concept design stage. Four, sorry, and then four, undertake a traffic survey to understand the current usage of the Laurel Avenue and Tamarack Avenue made roads and that consultation occurs with nearby residents on the use of, this, of these roads and that the results are presented to council. Okay, if I speak to the motion, I'm not gonna take long. I mean, council last year voted pretty overwhelmingly that they wanted to retain um, the Laurel Avenue site as, as open space. Between us, we selected the three options. Um, we've got a great report um, from Kelly and Aaron um, that puts the community garden top. Uh, I, think that's, I think that's probably the right answer. I think that's, that's probably going to get the space activated the most. And I really think this community consultation that's recommended uh, in the motion is what will really get people um, in Linden Park and the surrounding areas, hopefully the whole of Burnside, uh, involved in developing what this community garden will look like. Um, uh, everyone you talk to has got different ideas of what a community garden should be, and I think it's really good that we go out to everyone and say, what do you want? Do you want to have individual plots? Do you want community plots? Do you want to be people have got reserved spaces, do you want people, anybody, it's free for all, you can pick and plant whatever you like. Uh, I really think we need to flesh those ideas out and the best way to do that is by going out and asking people. Um, you've got your governance structures, you know, there's the Chapel Street and McGill has got an association and they run it very tightly. Oh, I think perhaps, you know, there's, there's scope for it to be run on a you know, more free form basis, but let's go out and ask people. Um, that's, the, that's the beauty of your consultation. Um, I think not having parks the right option, there's loads of parks, um, you know, within walking distance uh, of, of Laurel Avenue. I have to say, I'm, I know the additional tree cover of having a tree grove is probably not material, but I think you have to start somewhere. So I am hopeful that if we could take out the made road, if that was the, the, the will of community, there would be scope to, to plant some more trees there and potentially also where Tamarack Avenue is at the moment. You know, you think, wouldn't that be great as a, a, a tree-lined boulevard for people to, to walk through? You know, I, I, I'm loath to give up community land in Burnside. The, the one thing we've got plenty of in Burnside is roads. The one thing we don't have much of is open space and community land. And if there's any way we can grab back a bit of that land and turn it into green space, uh, I think that would be sensational. Um, as you can see, the community are out in force to, um, to support uh, tonight, and thank you all for coming. Uh, I, and uh, I commend the motion to you, and uh, I hope our visitors will be rewarded with the right result. Thank you. I need a seconder. Councillor Hubel. Thank you, Worship. Um, yes, I, yeah, I think this is something that we should be able to um, get through without too much um, trouble. I think, though, the community being involved in the design stage is a great idea. I think it's really giving power to the people, um, having a real meaningful say in how they're, not only that they're getting and retaining 
hopefully gaining some more open space, um, but then how exactly that is going to be used. Um, I think that's really, used, you know, really valuable um, and a bit of a change from do you want this or not, yes or no, kind of consultations, being able to say, come on, be involved in this with us, come along for the ride. Um, and I think uh, in terms of looking at number four, um, with the, you know, the made roads, I, I personally think that exploring any opportunity that we have to, you know, increase the amount of open space we have, especially when it, you know, doing so links existing spaces together to create, you know, something that is greater than the sum of its parts is uh, very, very worthwhile exploring. So I commend this motion to you all. Councillor Piggott. Thanks. A uh, couple of questions, if I may. Um, the recommendation around, or that we will be um, um, going out to the community with, uh, the report talks about a closed community garden. It talks about an open community garden. What, what sort of community garden are we actually ticking off here to go out to the community with? Through the chair. Uh, so the reference to closed community garden in the council report by the administration talks to about having the garden essentially lockable at night time, um, but open to the general public during the day to use and access. That wasn't the question. Uh, through your worship, the, um, the consultation will focus on um, the general support for a community garden this location uh, rather than um, the governance or management arrangements around a community garden. That would have to be fleshed out following the um, results of the community engagement. Um, there are several options that could be considered, uh, much like the, the one up in, uh, in McGill, McGill, which is very closed and membership based only, uh, down at Conningham Street or other um, gardens. I think you've got an example on your street today that's uh, open for all. The business case itself says that the best use of this land is for maximum community involvement and input. Um, so the, uh, the recommendation would be to try and maximise that community use of that site. How that works is something that council would have to consider at a later date. The uh, community garden in, in McGill is closed, which means it's limited to membership in terms of who uses it. Is, is that the closed, are you saying that's not the closed garden that the report very strongly says is the appropriate way to go forward? Because they do use McGill as a reference source they do. in terms of what they're talking about? Um, yes, they, they do. Um, and uh, in uh, reflection, I think we could have defined our use of the word closed better in the report. Uh, our intention was that the, uh, it should be lockable to ensure safety um, and uh, for security reasons in the evening, um, during evening hours. Um, but we would envisage, unless the council chooses otherwise, to have it fully open during the day and accessible. Which, which means it would be, um, and it, look, it doesn't, I don't think it goes on whether you close the gate at six o'clock, it, it goes on who can actually access it and, and be part of it. And, and uh, for mine, the argument swings quite heavily on that. So, so, in, so what you're saying is we are, we are advocating a community garden in there that would be free for all as such. Um, that's what we're, we are talking about. That's what we'll go out to the community with. Is it not a, not a, a McGill type arrangement that, uh, that ha is membership only? apart from 9 to 12 on a Tuesday when you can come and have a look. The, there's a potential of, of a combination of a, a few different options. We're suggesting that you don't make that decision at this stage. We're suggesting that you uh, consult with your community regarding the general support for a community garden in this space. Uh, depending on the general level of support who'd like to be involved, um, we've got a lot of work to do still on a management or a governance structure, which we'd like to work with council on. Uh, there could be an element of membership and um, allotment style um, plots. There could be open space, as you do have at Conningham Street as well. There could be council-run um, community allotments that we 
manage for programmes, intergenerational programmes, development op educational opportunities, that sort of thing. Or it could be a combination of all of the above. Right. Okay, and my final question on that really is, that for me is inconsistent with the recommendation of the report because it seemed to me it was quite clear about the fact because of the passive surveillance of the site and the special traits of the site that it, it, an open community garden was not a great idea but a closed community garden would be the place to way to go. We gave them three options. One of them had a subset of two and they went with a closed community garden. Would that be fair to say that's where the report has taken us? That was the recommendations of the consultant, absolutely, in terms of the business case option that was provided. Um, that's not the recommendations that were made by the administration at the stage. No, I understand that. Yep. Thank you. Councillor Carbone. Thank you, Your Worship. Question. Um, look, I'm, I'm in favour of the community garden. Okay, I'm on board. Um, what I probably have a few issues with is the entire site being a community garden. That's a lot. It's a big block of land. Um, and as you know, I'm very big on trying to increase our, our tree canopy cover. Uh, we've lost four trees this week in, uh, in Glenside. So I was always hopeful that a tree grove would be at least part of the block. Um, now, I know we're going out to do some surveys and so forth. If people wanted to express their view on a bit of a hybrid, you know, not all community garden, but, you know, maybe a lot of trees towards the back or something, I'm just wondering how would, would the survey be sympathetic to people who were thinking that way? Or would it be simply, which model do you want and that's it? Through your worship, if you turn to page uh, 141, um, without having developed the community engagement um, plan at this stage, some of those questions are actually covered that respond to your question in 50.2, if you support a community garden, uh, what elements would the community like to have included to complement the community garden use? Um, any strong outcomes from that will be presented back to council. But would the words to sort of prompt the answer, would the words, would you like a tree grove as well, would that be included? Because if, if they don't know what a, a tree grove is, they're not going to mention it. So. Can, can I just suggest, I think the, 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 that they're going to need to have prompts in there anyway, because there are going to be many people out there in our community that don't know what a community garden is, don't know the difference between a closed and an open, don't know that they, you can have a community garden that has Lot, plots that belong to certain groups or people and you can have also plots that are free for all and I think that's the sort of information that the questions need to be asking and they may require some prompting so that people can tick the things that they're interested in because they're not all going to know how to answer those questions as they are stated there at the moment mm. and that you know having tree, a tree grove might be one of those prompts or a thing that they cross off or tick. But I'm sure that the administration can take that on board. Would I be no, correct with that? Know what the most so, sorry, I, well, I think we would accept the variation if Councillor Carbone has got something in mind. I suppose maybe, could we uh, put some draft questions in the info docs and we could provide feedback before it goes out? Because once it goes out and the results come back, that's it. So I'm just wondering if we could maybe have a little bit of an input before it goes out. Uh, through you, Madam Mayor. Uh, I think it's entirely appropriate. I'd rather not start listing specifics in the resolution. Um, if the councils are happy, um, I'm happy to commit that prior to dissemination, the elected members be given the opportunity to provide input. I, I think that's a really sensible way for, to deal with it. Okay, thank you. Councillor Turnbull, you're next. Um, look, I've always been in favour of the Laurel Garden, the Laurel Avenue Community Garden, but I would like to ask, because it's such a, a high monetary value on this block of land, between 1 million and 1.4 million, if it would make practical sense to have a review after about maybe 10 years, it could be 8, 5, whatever an arbitrary number it is, so we can go into it and see, has it been successful, is it working, is it worth it? So I would like to add that in, if I could, that there is a review made in 
10 years' time to the success of the community garden. Uh, through Madam Mayor, uh, again, uh, again, if in. I may, Councillor, I don't, I don't think it's prudent to put in a, a finite amount of time, 10 years. Um, I think there should be undertaking that essentially any activity of this nature essentially undergoes a constant review um, and that if there is an issue, it would be brought back to Council. Um, I just, the concept of having a 10 year time period um, could could leave you exposed to having to live with a situation that is not working for 10 years, has it? Um, but if it's not working, um, at least to have a safeguard there to say, you know, five years' time, we will review it. Uh, I we, think need a, we need a safeguard. I really understand where you're coming from, Councillor Turnbull, but I think in this motion, it's only going out to community consultation. When the results of the community consultation come back and we make some sort of directed decision on what's going to happen, that's when you would put in that clause to, to put in the review. Okay. All right, okay. so keep it in your, put it in your little <laughs> remember box yeah. and come when we come back to that after the consultation. Then I think it's a good idea. I mean, it would, as, as Mr Cowley said, it is something that council would be reviewing anyway, but I think if you put, wanted to put that specifically in in the motion at that point in time would be better than now. Thank you. All right. Uh, Councillor Head. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, firstly, um, a couple of questions, Mayor. Uh, in the motion, item two, it refers to the numbers of people. My question is, people includes uh, adults and youth. Uh, through Madam Mayor, yes, correct. Thank you. So when we're trying to do more for youth in this city, because we've have got data now saying that youth, teens want to do more, this is an opportunity for the project to realise some benefits towards youth being engaged in community gardens, for example. Youth at risk, for example, could be an idea for project development. Uh, through Chair again. Uh, yes, these are all things that could be looked at and considered. Great, that's fantastic to hear. So then the other question I have is, um, uh, and it's a very good point, uh, Councillor Turnbull, the question I have is, um, at, will the project management framework which was raised in the audit committee, uh, I recall we were talking about it on the audit committee, will the project management framework do what Councillor Jenny Turnbull has suggested, which is that all projects um, in, in this framework, all projects are reviewed, lessons are learned, uh, benefits realised and monitored. So uh, to ask the question, would um, the framework cover, this is a policy framework that we understand we are implementing? Through your worship and Aaron, please step in if I, I get this slightly incorrect. I don't think that would be the mechanism to review this service following um, uh, a period of time. The project management framework will uh, provide you with the tools to take it from the concept design to completion uh, until opening or handover of the service. Um, you're talking about a service review? Uh, and that would have to be recovered through uh, uh, about the discussion of no, whether it's still No, provided. sorry, I'll clarify. Yeah, thank you. Um, what I meant was uh, a project management framework, uh, say in PMBOK, Project Management Book of Knowledge, talks about a project having KPIs and saying, okay, when we finish the project, even though we've spent, you know, $500,000, which is what we could do here, that um, the benefits aren't realised in day one, but maybe over a period of five years, we'll realise the benefits. So going back to Councillor Turnbull, she will be able to see that, yes, in five years' time, the benefits are realised. Uh, through your worship, again, I, I, I yeah. completely agree that that's, that's appropriate and, and that's some, certainly something that we should do as part of that service delivery. The project management framework will set KPIs for delivery of the project. Um, and, and that will be um, judged on its merits as that proceeds. Um, we'll be able to set similar KPIs through a service review me methodology once the service is up and running. 
and seeing whether it's delivering what Council has intended it to deliver. Yeah, still not quite convinced because um, when we you know, invest in infrastructure, the question I always have is, you know, when we, when we build something, we can't walk away as soon as we've finished the last um, contractor's uh, engagement. It's all about all the following work, so we have to budget for um, realising benefits sometimes. Like we had at Conningham Street. Through the chair, so the project management framework specifies a need yep. um, to do project plans for some projects of certain size, in which in those particular projects the benefits, the expected benefits of the project will be listed and defined. That's probably what you would then measure yeah. as part of your service Correct. reviews later. Th um, thank you. So you've answered my question. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Great. Um, so uh, yes, I, I will support this um, motion. Thank you. Councillor Dawes. Thank you, Mayor. I just wanted to make a couple of comments uh, in passing. I thought the consultant's business case was excellent. I thought it was easy to read, uh, it was well uh, put together, and uh, I enjoyed reading it, which I don't say about a lot of consultants' reports. <laughs> um, but I, I, I do think there's, n especially at the operations of the garden, there's no such thing as an original thought. There's only one that's been massaged. All right, so. Uh, with the McGill Community Garden, which is fenced, right, and it's got a wide variety of membership. Um, I know there's 20% live outside of, uh, of Burnside. That's probably because it's close to the boundary. Um, but that seems to, to work well. I noticed in paragraph 66 that uh, Aaron and, um, and Kelly have said uh, that it should benefit all areas of Burnside. So I, I'm guessing what you're saying there, it should be a slightly different model to McGill where we do have people from outside of the council area. But I, I kind of want to make though, my, my, my key one here is I met a gentleman uh, last week uh, at uh, a dinner and he came from an aged care facility. I know it's a slightly different group, but they decide to have an open garden, no fences, and you could take what you wanted uh, as only as to what you needed. And everybody was worried by that. They were really, really worried by it. It's been going for six months and it's going very, very well. And if you wanted something, you put a dollar coin or a, or a two dollar coin. So the trust was there from the start. So I just want to throw that into the, uh, into the melting pot because I think the way that that community garden operates is going to be very, very important. Um, and I heard what Councillor Pickett said as well. So I, I, I think there's something that we can do that makes this an excellent uh, community garden, but based on what everybody else has done. Thank you. Councillor Davis. I'd like to, uh, I, I guess, rewind a little bit and go back to the earlier debate regarding the motion. My, my reading of the motion says, commence community engagement on the community garden option and no other option. So we won't ask them about a tree grove. We won't even, we won't entertain the, that's my reading of the, the motion, is it doesn't give you any scope to consider any of the other options. And so the other three options are a tree grove. You know, does the administration agree with that, that by this, by passing this motion, you're constrained to only ask about a community garden? A bunch of fruit trees in there. If you could have a, a range of fruit trees growing in the garden. Not through, Madam Mayor. Um, Okay, move an amendment as well. I think it's prudent uh, for the sake of clarity because um, we are definitely intending to ask about things pertaining to a community garden but also broader um, that may incorporate the factors in page 40, park or tree grove as well. Yep. Is that correct? Yeah. Um, There's three, park, There's three. tree grove, community garden. I, I, I can't see how a tree grove is actually inconsistent with a community garden because the tree grove could be uh, planting and growing trees for no. planting elsewhere. The they could, could, yeah, could also it's be tree fruit trees. And it, it's a park. So the other concepts are different. Um, and yeah, no, I, I don't see that you have any option to go, like you've got a report that says one, two, three, considering different options, and then we're going with option one, we're only going with one option. Um, sorry, Madam Mayor. Um, 
What the intention is, is that as an administration, we are recommending that a community garden is the preferred use, but in the survey, we are asking them if a community garden was to go ahead, what other, what other elements, what other elements would you entertain or support around that community garden concept? Um, so your, some of your concerns may be alleviated in the design of the survey um, or, or not. Okay. I don't know if the movement sector would consider putting it in, putting in essentially those words, because at the moment it does say go on a community garden, that's it. So the whole site, my reading of it is the whole site would be a community garden. And so you could put it into commence community con engagement on the community garden, tree grove or park options. That'd be my suggestion. If I may, Madam Mayor, um, some words that you may choose to insert to alleviate uh, some concern. You could say commence community engagement on the community garden option. certainly very clear from the direction that I'm, I'm here around the chamber um, that this survey needs to incorporate uh, scope. I like it written down. No, no, I, I totally <laughs> Preferably in a 40 page no, contract. I, I, I totally understand. <laughs> Such as a trigger. Just ask one question, then I'll speak yes. to the motion. Yes. Yep. Uh, community engagement. What does it mean? How wide are we going? What is the plan? It might be in there. I apologise if it is. Perhaps you could tell me. Uh, through Madam Mayor. So we envisage uh, that the direct direct area, one to two kilometres around the site, but also available to the entire community via um, online um, survey and that sort of thing. Yeah, engage with site, etc. So, so the only direct communication will be to people within the immediate vicinity and how wide out? Uh, th Madam Mayor, th um, one to two kilometres wide, but we still would have the opportunity to promote the, the engagement on our engagement and sort of things like that Fair as enough. well. No worries. Look, that uh, I'm going to speak against this motion. I, I don't think we're ready to do this. I, uh, I do feel that we have, um, and the conversation that went before, lends itself to the argument. I think we, we, last time we narrowed down what we wanted to do with this. We wanted to keep it for the community and the three options we gave them were park, tree grove, which I assume was just plant trees and a community garden. The reports come back to me and uh, I'm, I'm, um, I feel what it's saying to us is because of the individual so, uh, site, uh, what the site's like, a park's not a good idea um, and I don't think there's any disagreement. It hasn't come up in conversation. Tree Grove is a, is a fairly small um, crack at sorting out the canopy, so probably not great use of it. So Community Garden comes up first. And, and of the three options, that does seem pretty clear. I, I agree with Mike. I enjoyed reading it. It did make a lot of sense to me. Um, but it did say clearly to me that the Community Garden, if we were to do it, would be, in their words, a closed Community Garden. Um, much like um, McGill actually runs uh, and has run pretty successfully um, for a number of years. But the problem with, the problem with that, um, and now I hear now we've actually, well, and the report I think said that. Um, now there's been a clarification today uh, that that's not the case and we are broadening it. But why, why that is key is that a community garden that is closed is by its nature limited to the number of people who will gain benefit from it. Um, 
we do need to, I think, if we are going to commit uh, public land and public funds, you've got to get a bang for your buck. And if we were to, my concern about not having it more tied down in terms of what we're talking about now, I'm not talking about not doing a community garden, but I don't think it is fair at the moment to ask questions given that we are not even sure what we're talking about and we're about to go out and, and ask the community and create expectations there. Because if it comes back and at the end of all of this, we say, well, the best probably was, as the report said, we have a closed community garden. We commit it to a community garden, they set up a govern, governing area, and it's a, it's a member, member only, by and large, like McGill, then that site looks like it would only accommodate about 40 members. The McGill site is a very similar size to, uh, to this site we're talking about, and they accommodate 37 members. Uh, there's 37 members in there. And that 1,500 square metres of public land in McGill, in my ward, basically is to the pretty much exclusive use of those 40 people. 37 people, actually. You'll get a couple more on this one. So, so I feel we do need to see whether that... The report did come back to say, community garden, great, but make it closed. Make it member only, don't make it accessible because of where it sits. It sits in, in between 13 houses and you can't see it from the Tregenza Oval because Tregenza Oval is set so high. So it's not a, a place that's got any passive surveillance. And I thought it was clear that the report said very much closed. So I feel that that is probably the most likely scenario that we'll have. Now that, that will, will cer certainly... Um, please certain people that will be involved. And I, I you know, uh, I, I think it's good the community wants to do something with it. But it could be that after the end of this exercise, we come back that it needs to be a community garden that is closed. And that'll be members only and about 40 people. So if that's the case, I think we then need to worry, Councillor Turnbull, absolutely right, talking about, you know, we need to make sure it works for the community. But I think we need to make sure it works before we start it. And if that was the case, um, we would have um, devoted this site and some, and you know, it's talking one hundred and fifty thousand dollars in in money to do it. And and so I, I'd, I'd like you to before you vote on this motion to just think about if we were being asked tonight, there's a block of land in Linden Park worth a million dollars. Now I want the council to buy that block of land for the million dollars and spend another $150,000 on that, okay? I want you to do that and set up a closed community garden for 40 people. I want you to consider that because that's effectively what we're doing. We need to consider the value of that land. You need to consider that if, that, if we didn't own it, would we buy it and do this with it? And I think we don't have our act together yet in terms of quite how we will use that to justify that decision. Councillor Cornish. Um, thank you, Mayor. I've just got a question, if I can. How um, strict are we keeping to the timelines that you guys have mentioned in the report in terms of the development? Uh, through Madam Mayor, uh, the timelines will depend, obviously, on what decision the council makes tonight. Yeah. Um, but we we would envisage that's the timelines that we would we would um we would stick to okay um i suppose uh, the the reason i i was going to move an amendment but i think it's probably a little bit out of place here and it's it's um it's a bit in regard to obviously we've we've gone through some bushfires in this state at the moment um i've received an email from my aunt who was burnt out in the hills and a local land care group up there are currently growing 75,000 trees in tube stock, and that's one land care group. We've got a, a vacant um, nursery at the moment. We've just built a new one, um, and they've run out of space to grow trees that need to actually rehabit all of these um, sites you know, in the hills on Kangaroo Island. And I just wondered whether or not we couldn't um, delay this project for a couple of years so we can actually help revegetate most of South Australia's um, uh, Adelaide Hills and maybe over in the KI with, 
with trees and, and tube stocks and really help them out since we've actually got you know, a set up space for it um, and just delay this project a little bit. Um, but since we're keeping to the timelines, I think I will um, vote against the motion as it stands. Thanks. Councillor Hude. I have a question for administration. Uh, no one has raised um, this question as yet, but are there concerns from administration with Councillor Jones removing um, the conversion of the road to a public road and I guess what the risks to council would be by not doing that? Uh, through your worship, no, that's fine. That was actually an option within the report itself that, that that's an option available to us and it gives us an opportunity to consult with the nearby residents, present you with all of the information before you decide whether to make that road or return it to public land. Okay, thank you. I have one further question. Is there currently a wait list for the community garden in McGill? So we're not at capacity? The one at McGill? Yeah. Sorry, the, uh, yeah, there's a wait list for the one at McGill. Okay, thank you. Councillor Lemon. Thank you. Um, gosh, hearing Councillor Piggott speak has made me really think, rethink this entire motion. I read this report and thought, yes, a community garden is the only way to go, but I don't believe we should be um, doing this for a limited group of people or the ones that put their hands up first. That really disturbs me. Um, Linden Park is a decent sized place and I think that having a closed community garden, which is apparently what we're likely to have here, uh, I don't think is good enough for the community as a whole. So um, brings me to the second point about the sort of questions we'll ask when we do our community engagement. Um, and that needs to be one of them. I actually think that we need to canvass this with people when we talk to them. Which brings me to the other point. Do we actually know what we're doing yet? Because I, don't, I, I originally pressed my button to talk about the, um, the unlikelihood of having a tree grove and a community garden. This is a site of 1,500 square metres. I don't think you can have big canopy trees and grow veggies depending on what, how you cite things, you have to be very, very careful how you do that. I think that's pretty much mutually exclusive in terms of sunshine and open space. So I, I, don't, I, I too don't think we're quite at, at the right spot to go ahead at this stage. I think we need to be a lot clearer about what sorts of questions we're going to ask of people before we go ahead. And then finally, Councillor Cornish talking about it's a working nursery. It, it's actually produced tube stock since 1985. We need it. And not only do we need it to reforest, we need it so the koalas that have now lost their habitat have trees to eat. We need it so that the habitat is restored in places like the Adelaide Hills and Kangaroo Island. And we've got the perfect place for it. This is. This is a disused bus station when you need a disused bus station. It is there. It can be got up to speed. This is something Burnside could do for parts of South Australia. I, and I'm, I feel quite strongly that we ought to be doing this and we ought to be doing it yesterday. We ought to be doing this. And if it means putting this on hold for a couple of years, I don't think the residents will mind, really, knowing that their community and their city is actually pulling its way uh, for reforestation elsewhere. I just think that's a fantastic thing to do. Councillor Davis. I'm really, really, really anxious about this project. So my understanding is that the value of that land is uh, $1 million, we're going to spend $150,000 in it. Maybe we can get 40 plots. I think that the only way this is really going to go is it's going to be a closed, closed facility. Now, for each one of those plots on a yearly basis, what you're looking at, the worth is $30,000 per plot. So that's a facility that you're going to provide to the community, to one person. It's $30,000 facility for one person. Now, that's $1.15 million worth of assets collectively. When you look at the other projects that this council has considered and the cost benefit of that, 
If you look at the pool, we spent $6.8 million on a pool upgrade and we have 100,000 visitors a year, every single year. That's $68 per visitor. That's got to be better bang for, uh, bang for buck than 30 grand infrastructure facility for one person. Same with Glenunga Hub. How much did we spend on Glenunga Hub? Four, four and a half million? Five million? And how much, you know, what other facilities are in the Burnside area, um, like the tennis club or, or things like that, which are crying out for funding? We gave the tennis club um, $100,000, and that was for how many members in the tennis club, an entire tennis club um, in Glenunga. What we're looking to do here is essentially giving a facility worth $30,000 for each plot to 40 people within a context of you know, residents of 45,000 residents. That, that really, really does not sit easy with me. I mean, how much would you pay as a councillor to rent one of a plot for a year? Um, you could pay $1,000 for 30 years, I suppose. Every single one of those plots is one of Councillor Carbone's um, tree, you know, tree schemes or, or something else or some other way to invest in it. I mean, like Councillor Piggott, I, I walk past the Chapel Street, I go walking in that area, I'm like, wow, that's great, and I peer over the fence. They've got, um, they've got grapes in front now, so you can't really see, and I understand that they have um, you know, community open days and things like that. I've never, that I can recall, been invited to one, and it really is, when you look at that space, it's taking it away from everybody else in that region to use it. So my question is, and I don't think I will vote for this because I, I feel very uneasy in terms of spending $30,000 on a single plot, which will be closed, I guarantee it will be closed, um, for each single person to use it, whereas uh, there's got to be a better way, a better way to use that funding of $1.15 million. And is this really the way that Burnside wants to spend it? When we've got clubs crying up for funding... We've got things like, you know, projects like the Burnside Pool with 100,000 visitors, 68 bucks per visitor per year. Um, that's a lot better bang for buck than me. So I'm going to vote against this um, or at least put it off until I think that we make up our mind. I certainly don't like the idea of being closed. And I think that going out with a broad plan to have it open or closed to the community, it will come back with a closed... It will come back closed. I think that's the only way it's going to work. It's the only way that you're going to get individuals taking over it. So I feel really uneasy about this motion. I feel really uneasy about going forward for 30 grand a pop when there's so many other deserving um, clubs and facilities that are in, in desperate need of repair in the city of Burnside. Councillor Cabo. Uh, another question, if I may. Um, there's been a lot of talk about Bank for Buck tonight um, and also this debate around clarity and so forth. So I have another question, and if you could just humour me for a minute. So if we were to do uh, a half tree grove, half community garden, so that's a virtually a block of land for each, okay? So if that helps visualise shadows and clashing and so forth and growth and all that kind of thing. So on a normal block of land, keeping one for the community garden, on a normal block of land, how many eventual significant native eucalyptus trees could you grow on that one block of land. <laughs> Through your worship, I'm sure you're not surprised that I can't answer that question. <laughs> says that if you are growing um, the trees for canopy cover, not many. If you're growing it for tube stock, a lot more. So. No, 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 no. Well I'll, I'll ask the question again. We're planting them in the ground, okay? They're going to stay there forever, like a park. Yeah. I can't answer that question, that specific question. Because it would help maybe soften the blow out there to the public that it's not a uh, million dollars for land, it's a million dollars for 30 significant trees one day, that they might be able to swallow. But, uh, all right. 
I'll leave it at that. Councillor Turnbull. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, one unusual question. The people who have the plots, the 37 over at, at McGill, uh, the Chapel Street one, do they have them forever or they are recycled? Do they leave them in their will? What happens? They trade on the share market. Uh, through Madam Mayor, my understanding is that it's an annual renewal of, of the permit, uh, but those that do have an existing plot do get first right of renewal. So that could actually be um, amended, so people could have a plot for two years, put in another 37 people, let's keep the people going. And I think that Burnside spends a lot of money on the clubs, on the tennis clubs and bowling clubs, etc. This is a different form of activity. So. I'm fully in favour of it because it's for different types of people. You've got your little kids coming in, your elderly people, you've got your middle-aged, everyone. Whereas your tennis club, you haven't. So I would like to see the money spent on, on this and if, if it could be amended so that people don't hog that plot forever and leave it in their will, that would be good too. And I'll push again for a five-year review. <laughs> I thought it was ten. Ten, or, ten or five, <laughs> eight, whatever. Councillor Hughes. Um, I haven't spoken yet, I've just asked questions. Um, I feel that the motion is sufficient in that it's not locking us down to anything. It's simply going to ask the community a question and they could well come back and say, we don't want a community garden and this all becomes a bit of a you know, pointless debate. So look, my view is this, these results can come back and we then have the opportunity to consider that and then make a decision around what the community wants, similar to what we do with lots of other things within the city of Burnside. We've got the car park coming up later tonight. We went and asked people, what do you want to do? And that's, that will help inform us of the decision that we make going forward. So that's my position. I think the motion is well, perhaps vague enough that it, it gives the staff enough leeway to ask the right questions and as we've been informed we'll be given the opportunity to review them. So yes, I, I appreciate some of the concerns that other councillors have but I think we should actually just go out and ask the question and see, see what response we, we actually do get and then we can all come back and debate it um, as to whether it's open, closed, olive grove, not whatever, you know, not olive grove, we would only plant natives. But, um, so I, I, <laughs> I just say olive grove. I say that because there is an olive grove um, in uh, Beaumont. Not is it Beaumont? Yeah. Ca Councillor Davis, yeah. do you have so, a question? Anyway, so sorry. That is, um, I will support the motion as it stands, and I think it will enlighten us as to what the community actually wants. Yeah. Um, I do have a question. Councillor Hubel made, made a good point in the in the motion coming out. We actually put to the community the cost and that benefit analysis um, and the community consultation reflected on that cost and understanding of what the asset was worth. Can we also put that or should I wait until you seek feedback from elected members? Yeah, Councillor Hughes. <laughs> um, I won't comment. Okay. Three, uh, three minute, Mayor. Um, I think in terms of ensuring that the community understands the ramifications, the relevant options they are being asked to comment on, I think it's appropriate to include that in the survey documentation. Thank you. I'm just about to return to uh, Councillor Jones, but I just wanted to say that the two photographs that I put on your desk tonight are of an open community garden. It is actually on South Terrace behind Veal Gardens. It is open all the time. It does not, it has a membership, but it, it, nobody owns a plot. The plots are all available for anyone to use. And in fact, this is the notice board that they have out the front that gives the rules as to how it operates. They also have a notice board there with telling people what they should plant or shouldn't plant because of the climate and the time of the year, etc. And so it operates as a very open garden. There's also uh, an open garden that operates within St Saviour's Church grounds that is open and accessible at all times for anyone, anyone who lives in, not just in Burnside, anywhere at all. And the, they can go in and plant things, grow things, pick things, and come and go as they please. So if that helps people to understand, a closed garden is just the opposite. So it's just the... Uh, I think, 
you were going to comment on that, Barry, that it wasn't recommended yeah, in the report. Yeah, um, what Barry was, I was chatting before is it didn't come out in the BRM report, but it was not. Yeah, that's right. Well, they left out the, a couple of other community gardens as well, but um, it wasn't clear in that. But, that, but the, all I wanted is to show you is the difference, be, sh make people aware of the difference between the one at McGill, which you have been talking about, which is very much closed. Yes, uh, whereas this one in South Terrace belongs to the City of Adelaide is a very open garden where nobody owns anything. Yeah. So just, <laughs> just helping to clarify. That's all. Okay, so it's back to Councillor Jones. Thank you to everyone for your contribution. I think the key thing, three words, Councillor Hubel said to me, commence community engagement. That's what we're asking people, the council to vote on today. We've disappeared down a rabbit warren that it's gonna be a closed community garden. I don't agree. Where it's open one morning a week. That's certainly not what I want. I don't think that's what the community want. My view at the moment, if you look at the site, you've got the 1500 square meters, the little square at the top where the, the nursery currently is, that's locked away full time. It's potentially it could be locked, lockable at night, but it doesn't have to be. I mean, Warrigo Reserves in Linden Park, that's accessed by two little alleyways. That's not, you know, uh, a magnet for troublemakers. Maybe we wouldn't need to leave it open. It's open, but I certainly would envisage, even if people have their plots, or if the school has a plot, or if Regis has a plot, or the council has a plot that people come in with, people will still be able to access it during daylight hours, seven days a week, even if it, even if it were locked at night, which it might not have to be. You've also got the triangle outside, which is 1,000 square metres, plus it would be bigger if we add the road in, uh, add in the, the, the road between Laurel and Wems. Then we might have the bit with Tamara. Then you're joining the whole Tregenza Oval site to be one. I think it would be fantastic. Uh, I don't see that that would be locked away or that that would be a closed community garden that nobody could access to. Um, Councillor Turnbull and Councillor Henschke have raised valid points about, you know, um, tenure over the site. And we have that all kinds of sites. We have sporting clubs. You know, you give them a lease for a period of time and then at the end of it you might say, we don't want a tennis club any anymore. Um, we'll give it to someone else. We'll have a netball club. Um, and, and I think that's a sensible idea. But as I think it was um, one of the important people here said, we haven't even got to thinking about how governance structures and, and how it will be organised. Maybe the council will run the whole thing. You know, and, and then you know, we can review it any time, as, as, as we can with any uh, piece of community land. Noting, of course, I know people have got $1.4 million, $1 million in their eye and what they're going to spend it on. Bear in mind, it's community land. You do need the minister to approve any sale of community land. And he might have the deputy premier saying that would be a career-limiting move, minister. But that's just my, just my thoughts on the subject. Um, so tree grow, I agree, Councillor Carbon. I think we could plant some trees there. I think it's great that we've added in the ancillary things on the site. I think we could squeeze some in. I don't know about the number of trees. But you would have thought you could say, we've got 100% canopy cover. It just depends what you plant. It's the canopy cover that's important, it seems to me, not necessarily how many trees. I mean, you could, you could probably plant a conifer forest in there if you wanted to maximise the number of trees, but that might not look so nice. Um, so I, I think the canopy cover is the important thing. Um, so I think that's probably... Uh, summing up what I think you know, the objections were. And, and um, I think, as Councillor Hubel pointed out, commence community engagement. Let's see what the people want. Uh, I don't think we'll end up with a, a closed garden. I think we'll have something uh, that is open to all, be open to everyone in Burnside. We know the Chapel Street one. Uh, people from all over Burnside come to, even beyond. Maybe we should be looking at the governance arrangement, the Chapel Street one, say, guys, it's council land, you need to open it more than one morning a week. We've probably opened a can of worms there for the, the uh, McGill Ward Chapel people. people. Um, but, um, yeah, so I, uh, I hope you'll support the motion. Thank you. Right, those in favour? Those against? Carried. I'm going to just make a suggestion now, and I'll be guided by you.
We normally would have a break at nine o'clock, around nine. I'm just going to suggest that now might be an appropriate time as some of the people leave, leave the, the, the chamber and that we may have our break now and then return in 10 minutes. Are you in favour of that, please? Thank you very much. And thank you for the gallery for coming along tonight. And we will take that 10 minute break and I'll start again at 8.50. Please be prompt so that we can return. We might even finish before 10 o'clock tonight. on the screen though. Rob, I need the screen, please. All right, I'm going to go through the list and ask if you, anyone wishes to withdraw any of these motions or any of these reports for discussion. Uh, button, please. Starting with uh, Burnside War Memorial Hospital. Nobody's responded, so are you wish willing to vote on that right away? Councillor Cornish moved, seconded Councillor Davis. Um, all those in favour? Carried. Revised Burnside Village Land Manager Agreement, which must be done, decided upon tonight. So need someone to withdraw it. Councillor Lemon, seconded by... Oh, so do you wish to... You're happy to, for it to go straight ahead? No. All right, so you're going to move it, Council Lemon? Yes. Seconded by... I've got no names on there, so I'm, going to, yeah. I'm looking for hands. Councillor Davis, those in favour? Carried. Regional subsidiaries, Eastern Health and Era Water Financial Budget Reviews. Anyone who wishes to withdraw it for a debate? All right, Councillor Piggott, thank you. 13.4, Glen Osmond Road, request to dis discharge an encumbrance. Councillor Lemon. Hazelwood Park Car Park. Councillor Hughes. City Streetscapes. No, so looking for somebody to move it. Councillor Lemon moved. Councillor Hubel seconded. All those in favour? Carried. Yes, it was a very good report. Thank you for all those involved. 13.7, initiatives for utilising RFID technology in curbside bins. Councillor Piggott. Um, we've done that one. 13.9, uh, support promotion of music and buskers. I guess it must be you, Mr Carbone. Um, I actually have the call. Sorry? Councillor Davis already has it on the screen. Apologies. Um, and there we now we go back to 13.1. Or did we do that one? We did that one. Okay, I didn't tick it. Okay, 13, no, 13.2. Councillor Piggott, revised. 13.3. Oh, does that one get done? Yes, that one got done. Oh, sorry. Uh, Lemon, uh, sorry, Councillor Lemon, 13.3. Uh, you wish to? Councillor Piggott. Oh, I put it down for the wrong one. Sorry, Councillor Piggott. Regional subsidiaries. Okay. Uh, you're not on. <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> um, I'd like I'd like to um, propose an alternative uh, motion, uh, which might be in there. Is it in there? <laughs> uh, yep. I'd like to propose the uh, motion. Thank you, Rob. Get me back on stream. Um, the council defer consideration of the year award budget until the receipt of the 2021 annual plan and budget anticipated in late March and to approve the Eastern Health Authority first budget review for 2019-20, noting the forecast result remains at $28,000 operating deficit position. Um, and you'll note that the EHA one is as recommended. I don't have any comments on it, clearly. 
I don't think anyone else does, but, um, but I'd see no reason in not accepting that. The reason why I put an alternative on Era Water was I, I have attended my first um, audit committee meeting as the Burnside representative. And what's happened since this, uh, this budget was put through to us or went to the board late last year uh, and, um, and was, was approved and then sent to the council, um, time has moved on a bit. The, the audit committee considered a budget review too last, last week, so there has, uh, it does indicate that the sale of water won't be as strong as what it was in this budget review one. Um, and second is that there was a general um, view or a recommendation to, to do some considerable work on the budget and the financial reporting for Era Water ahead of the 2021 annual plan. There's a requirement on regional subsidiaries to provide by the end of March to each of constituent councils a, a budget going forward uh, for the next financial year. And ahead of that, um, considerable amount of work to be done given a couple of things. One is now we have had a season, not a very um, um, good season rainfall wise, but we have, uh, Era Water has had that. And as of, um, so I'm told by Alan, as of this, this coming week or two, um, all, if not all, all but one perhaps, um, reserves in Burnside have been connected and commissioned and able to take water. So obviously that allows sale of water and, and, and that's similar in the other two councils. Um, the second thing is just a recognition that Era Water needs to um, be far more robust in its budgeting. And uh, this is me speak, I guess, but I, it was reflected in the, in the audit committee minutes when they come out, I'm sure. Um, much more robust in their budgeting and their reporting back to constituent councils. That may, sh may indicate, um, you know, upfront poorer results, um, but um, the plan would be to aim to actually achieve those results as opposed to what is currently happening where, where there is a, a uh, and this being a case in point, um, the amount of water that's been sold over the last month is obviously affected by the fact that not all connections have been commissioned. So, so, so I feel as a council uh, it's not appropriate to uh, a approve that budget. It doesn't really mean anything anyway. It's now been superseded. Um, but also I think we should um, um, you know, send the message to Era Water that we are waiting for it, the job to be done well in March and at that point we uh, look at it in some detail. By Sarah, Councillor Hughes. I will second the motion. I think it's also worth mentioning um, that Councillor Piggott has corresponded directly with the Chairman of the Board to ensure that this motion would not cause any <laughs> issues um, as we have you know, <laughs> been in that position in the past. So I think that's probably also worth mentioning. There is a board meeting on Friday where um, we will obviously be, re be reviewing the budgets which will then come back to Council. So I think um, as Councillor Piggott has mentioned, it's worth just putting that on hold. There is a significant focus of Era Water to make sure that reporting is realistic that's coming back to Council. And I think we've just been in an unfortunate position where all of the connections haven't been in place um, before the, the start of the irrigation season, um, as well as obviously the significant lack of rainfall over the last six months. So I will definitely support the motion as it stands. Thank you. Councillor Davis. I agree with the first point. I don't agree with the second in terms of not approving a budget to send them a message. I think if we want to send them a message, let's write a letter saying you're doing a terrible job or this is what we want you to do. You know, this is how we want you to improve your budget. Not, not through debate and not approving the budget. I think that's a, it's quite, yeah. I think that there are better ways to do it and especially since we've got um, Councillor Hughes on the board, I suppose that should be a, um, we should be going through her really and saying, Councillor Hughes, these are things you need to fix up um, and need to ensure that they happen. Um, but, sure. Councillor Dort. Yeah, just a, a, a couple of points for me. Uh, on page 237, it talked about the proceeds from the sale of property of 191,000. And I, I just wanted, I don't know if anybody, I know that Councillor Hughes can't answer that, but I'm wondering if Councillor Pickett can answer what what do they sell? Can I put it on notice, perhaps? Uh, 
Um, yeah, I, I'm very. Yeah, thank, thanks, uh, Councillor Pickett. I, I think the the key for me is the word robust. And you know, I, again, uh, I don't know why they do it, um, but they had sales uh, was a, a new figure of seven hundred and fourteen thousand dollars for sales. I know it's September, and that was before we knew maybe a lot of rain and so forth. But that meant that over 200 megalitres would have been supplied to the councils. Now, according to Warbridge and, uh, and those guys, that only 70% can be extracted. I think Tonkin think only 50% could be extracted. So to get the 70% factor in the 204 megalitres, you mean you may have a lot more that you have to harvest. So I just feel like they should have been up front on these things. They don't put in such a high figure and then keep coming back every quarter and say, I'm sorry, it's now going to be a million dollars loss or whatever it is. Because that what that produces is a lack of confidence in the in the board. But I do take what Councillor Davis said. It's really uh, our representative here is Councillor Hughes and I'm sure she'll pass it on. Thank you. Councillor Turnbull. Okay. I'm Thanks, me. I'm going to put the cat amongst the pigeons and say, since the current budget deficit is even worse than predicted, it's my intention to raise at a future meeting the question of Burnside Council's ongoing commitment to this project. To me, it seems the hole in the bucket's got bigger. It's not getting any better. Thank you. Don't have anyone else on the screen, so um, I will go back to Councillor Piggott. Uh, yeah, thank you for your input. Just, um, just picking on Councillor Davis, I, I'm, perhaps I, I got it wrong. I, this is not about sending them a message through the um, through the um, motion. Um, I don't think we're in a position to accept that budget. It's now been superseded. The budget's now different. So I don't think as a council we could accept it. So from that point of view, we should defer consideration of it. Um, the second bit of that was that the message going back was actually, I think, started in the audit committee. I think it actually might have started the previous board meeting with, with Sarah. And I think the, the initiative of getting us onto those committees has, you know, it, it, it is starting to, to make a difference. And that's where the message will certainly come from. It's not, you know, this doesn't do anything in terms of setting that message. Um, what that was, was perhaps a, a you know, a, a source of hope that, um, that we can sort this, sort this out and, and address some of the issues. Uh, Councillor Dawes, um, that's right. That is right. The, uh, I think in September they assumed that there'd be enough water, that we would get enough water by the end of winter. And then based on what um, reserves have taken on average going forward, that would come back out. They'd sell it to the um, councils and they'd sell the 200 and whatever you told me it was, megalitres before the end of the year. That's what they assumed. Fact is, it didn't rain. Fact is, connections weren't there at the start of December when the irrigation system was happening, so it wasn't achieved. Um, and that is pretty much around the conversation that is being had in Eora Water now. And the significance of the March is the fact that it is a, a year, a couple more year, uh, months down the track of water coming out into reserves, now commissioned, etc. So what you're saying is absolutely on the money. What you're saying, Jenny, also, um, not quite on the money. I, I, I do feel that um, I would like you to just sort of hold the um, course a little longer because we, we have made some changes this year. It, it remains to be seen what changes come through that we can make by being in there, but I do think it is significant what comes out in March. Um, it will show that um, it is a project that will need investment in the next two, three X years. There's no question in terms of it will not return money to constituent councils. I think the important thing is to actually get a handle on what those numbers are. At the moment, we can't get a handle on it because it moves every time we see some numbers. So the first thing I feel we should do is get to that point, to actually get some clarity into you know, how much getting all the, the reserves connected, getting all that sorted out, having another year of rain, hopefully, and, um, and seeing where we're up to there. 
because I think it's it's uh, it's still in the bedding down stage. At some point, it may not be, and um, your your concept of the whole of the bucket might be on, but it's not quite yet. I feel, but for this motion, I think we lose nothing actually by deferring consideration. We um, and um, but we do need to um, you know devote some time in March when it comes through. Right, those in favour of the motion, raise your hands. Those against, carry. Now we're moving to 351 Glen Osmond Road. That was Councillor Lemon. Thank you. Um, I'm happy to move the officer's recommendation, but I do have some questions. And um, I read this report a couple of times, and there's some anomalies here that just made me feel uncomfortable. Uh, and I felt, and I kept looking for the catch and I couldn't find it. So, th this was a relatively recent encumbrance. It was actually put through in 1970. I, I, I was actually a sentient being in 1970, amazingly enough. Um, and it was put through in 1970 by three people in three different states, I think, or two different states. None of them were South Australia. And I guess what I really want to know, and I'm not unhappy with how everything's been explained, but what I really want to know is, by getting rid of this encumbrance, what does it actually mean? Can we have an 11-storey building somewhere there? Like, what is the worst-case scenario that getting rid of this encumbrance will give us? <coughs> From a planning perspective, um, in terms of what might take the place of those residences that are currently under this encumbrance? What, what is the worst case scenario? Through the chair, once the encumbrance is no longer there, then all development matters are then um, handled, if you like, through the devel development plan, as is always the case. So the worst, the worst case scenario is a, uh, essentially a two-storey house. At, a, at about nine nine metres in height, um, so and that that derives from the development plan. So the absence of this encumbrance doesn't mean it, it's open slather in terms of development. It's still that the, the ordinary control, which is the development plan, or or in four months' time the planning and design code. <coughs> what it also means, I guess, through the chair, is that uh, matters that aren't covered by development uh, won't will no longer be covered, such as the removal of trees that are not regulated trees, um, the construction of fences which are currently sought to be prohibited by the encumbrance. So, so the worst case scenario includes a two storey house with colour bond fencing and, a, uh, and a, an absence of trees. So in fact the worst case scenario could be one block with two two storey houses and colour bond fencing and no garden. Uh, through through the chair, if that's supported by the development plan in terms of density, then yes. And another question, if I may. Does the, this encumbrance also have bearing upon the uh, the structure known as Benacre, the, the heritage-listed building? Uh, I read somewhere in here that there could be a change of use where it becomes a venue or... Other, I'm sure I read that, or maybe I dreamt it. Is it is does this have bearing upon that heritage listed property and its use? Through the chair, the encumbrance does. So the the encumbrance uh, includes that the original Ben Acre property being the state heritage place, and allotments either side of it. So uh, down Ben Acre, close and around the corner onto Glenelgham Road, but also some properties on the other side of. Ben Acre on, I believe it's Ashley, indeed it is Ashley, Ashley Avenue. Uh, so this bit, but this particular port will have no bearing on uh, Ben Acre House because it replies only to 351 uh, Glen Osmond Road. Uh, in, in, and it will have no bearing on any, any change of use application in relation to Ben Acre House. So I, I'm not aware of any, but I could certainly take that on notice as a separate matter. In, in terms of inf uh, providing information back in relation to any application there might be 
separatists about the change of use of Ben Aiken House. I'll speak to the motion now, if I may. Um, I always feel uncomfortable about removing encumbrances because I feel that they were originally put there for a very good reason. I'm not sure about this one. This one's relatively recent. It wasn't done last century or the, even the century before. This was done in 1970. And my reading of it is that it was done by people that wanted to control the development that went up that was taking place on either side of Ben Acre, which is a heritage listed property, um, to the extent that these people were controlling what trees they could remove, what sort of materials they could use for fencing, and you know, I, but you still want to actually sell those blocks of land and make money. So nice work if you can get away with it. Um, in this case, having had answers to my questions. If the worst case scenario is um, housing stock that's replaced within the, st the strictures of our current planning guidelines, I don't think that's a bad thing. And I also think that having these sorts of encumbrances um, are actually unnecessarily burdensome on people that buy the properties. Um, historically, because previous owners wanted to control. So I, I, I actually move the officer's recommendation and I urge you to support it. Councillor Davis, you wish to second? Yeah, v very quickly, yes. A lot of these, my understanding was that this is a historic thing where developers would put the encumbrances over large parcels of land to control the development within a certain region. And then the Development Act came through and essentially um, superseded a lot of those things. Um, and from a legal point of view, um, attempting to defend some of these encumbrances uh, would be an interesting matter. Um, so generally, when you see these encumbrances, I'd vote to, with the officer's recommendation if they're on the view to remove them. Councillor Dawes. I went there today, actually. I, I've never heard of Benaker House, and it, what a wonderful place it is. It's being renovated at the moment, and it was built in 1878, and the mews were earlier than that, 1850, they look magnificent. But this property is a fair distance away from, from that. Is it heritage listed? I guess it would be. If, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. So I never knew it existed. You must go and all have a look at it because it is a magnificent home. Um, but if this was next door, I would probably be very worried. But it is a fair distance away and it is on, on Glen Osmond Road and they are knocking down a fairly old house as well. So uh, I'll be supporting the motion. Councillor Jones. Uh, I have to say I don't agree with this. Uh, the key for me is paragraph 22 in the officer report says these are matters that are adequately dealt with through the development assessment process as legislated. I mean, I think our, ter our current development plan as dictated to us by the state government is terrible and in four months' time it's about to become utterly dreadful at which point this block you'll be able to stick in 10, 15 dog boxes. It's an absolute disgrace. I cannot support this. People have bought it with an encumbrance. It's just bad luck. You know what you're buying, and then you come here and say, take it off, and your property price goes up half a million dollars. Well, nice work if you can get it. I just, this is just wrong, and I'll be voting against it. I don't have anyone else on the screen. Oh, no. Councillor Hengke. Oh, thank you, Mayor. I just wanted to clarify, when I googled Benacre House, and I've heard tonight it's a state heritage protected house, and it's also documented in this report, like, don't believe everything Google says, but it says it was listed on the now defunct register of the national state. Is it in the development, so if a development plan is applied to this neighbouring property, will the historic um, character be considered? Is it, yeah, thank you. Through, through the chair, um, it, it's probably also the, the building, Ben Acre House, is a state heritage place, which it is, is a listed. formal heritage yeah. listing for the purposes okay. of development assessment. Mm -hmm. It's probably worth pointing out as well that it wouldn't have been in 1970, so state heritage came mm -hmm. at least six years after that, so the environment then was different. Okay. Um, so we're now, now able to 
uh, SS applications in relation to Ben Acre and things that might impact on Ben Acre in regard to its state heritage um, okay. status. The other thing yeah. you mentioned, I think, was the register of the national estate. That's a different mm. listing mm -hmm. and uh, it's not a formal listing. So the, the important one from a regulatory point of view is the local or state listing, in this case, the state listing. Right, there's no one else on my screen, so back to you, Councillor Lemon. Uh, thank you. Uh, you can put the motion, thank you. Right. Any, um, those in favour, please, raise your hands. Those against, carried. I move to Urban, Urban and Community, Hazelwood Park, Car Park, Councillor Hughes. I will talk briefly. I think the report speaks for itself. I think the consultation um, obviously was valid in terms of the fact that what was proposed potentially doesn't align with the conservation management plan as it currently stands. So I think seeking the feedback from the community was worthwhile and I'm happy to move with the officer's recommendation as it stands. Councillor Lemon, you're seconding? Yes, I'm happy to second this. I, I, uh, I think that the community consultation was excellent and I was, I was really interested to read that they wanted the the feel of the park to stay, the sense of the park, the, the sense of that sort of country, countryfied area. And um, of course, refurbishing the car park in this way will maintain that. Councillor Hubel. Uh, I will support this, but I did have a, a comment on this. Um, I heard a lot about this um, survey from, um, um, people I'm associated with at Burnside Primary School, so a lot of people tend to come to me with council matters and a lot of people approached me about this and said, million dollars for a car park, what are you on about? <laughs> um, and I just said, look, we're, we're putting forward several options. We're not expecting the uh, full permeable paving to get up. In fact, if that's what the community selected, we would probably have a hard time in this chamber swallowing that and moving on with it. Um, but I guess in saying that, I, I do want to continue being mindful of, you know, in this case, it was a water-sensitive urban design option when we're looking at new, new projects. Um, look, if we won the, won the lottery, Burnside Council won the lottery, one of the first things I'd do would be, OK, let's, let's throw some money at a, at a landmark-type project like this that brings, uh, brings attention to you know, these this new and, I guess, really quite exciting technologies that are starting to present themselves to us. Um, but also, like the report said, it's not the optimal type of space, um, and I will definitely be supporting this. I just wanted to give some perspective on that. Councillor Temp. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I'm following on from Councillor Hubel. I really don't understand how repaving with asphalt fits in with our climate change emergency for which our council voted to accept last September. It doesn't really. I know it's too expensive to have the other, but option three is half a million. Um, maybe worth thinking about because I think I go to that part most days. The area up near Howard Terrace could really do with permeable paving because there's more trees there. Then you could use asphalt down the other end, down Davenport Terrace, because it goes against our climate change emergency. Why are we espousing this stuff and not following it? That's my question. Councillor Dave. I wasn't a question. Um, I guess I'll ask that question. Um, how will the ash well, how does the administration view that the asphalt will affect the trees um, which are currently in the in the region? Uh, through the chair, um, any projects. Uh, we undertake that are near trees. We will always get one of our arboriculture team out to work with us before we start any works, identify any um, practices that we need to apply around trees to make sure that they're not damaged in any way. Um, the good thing with uh, resurfacing with asphalt it may, is that we don't need to do a lot of work um, digging and disturbing the trees that are currently there. So we should be, um, they should be happy about that if you like. Um, we did 
mentioned in the previous report that we uh, wrote on this topic uh, that if the option did come up to, to resurface with asphalt, we'd be looking to um, profile that asphalt in a way that directed the water to the tree. So we would be applying a water sensitive urban design approach to use of the asphalt um, in that regard as well. Does that answer your question? And just very briefly on this matter, I was, I was like reading through some of the comments. I think people misunderstood what they meant by status quo. I think a lot of people said, understood status quo to mean option one to mean do nothing at all, as in don't even repave it with asphalt. And they're, you know, they're saying, um, leave it the way it is, it's fine. And my understanding is that that's actually been counted in option one. I think I'd go with option one regardless of the number. It does seem to be some percentage, but a lot smaller percentage, but I think that that's important for the administration to consider if people are saying do nothing and status quo is do something which is reinstate the existing surface. So I think there was some confusion in that consultation. I have no one on the screen, so I'm happy to go back to Councillor Hughes. Just briefly, I think the um, question has been answered around how water would be managed. I think it is a um, perhaps a financially sensible option that will still provide benefit to the trees um, within the car park. So I hope you'll all support the motion. Those in favour? Those against? Two. Uh, initiatives. Councillor Piggott. I think it's 13.7, page 123. Um, would I be able to ask a question before I uh, move the motion? That would be all right? That will depend on the answer to the question. Oh, okay. Is that right? I'm probably happy. Question without notice. Is that allowed? Thank you. Question without notice. Um, look, my question is around the, um, the uh, red bin and the fact that reading the report, East Waste Now can... Um, have got the technology working okay in terms of measuring individual bins, in terms of their volume or weight. Um, and I, I wondered, so I, my first question is, is that the case? Are we confident that they could tell us what weight went in the red bin or any of the bins um, each time it's picked up? Are we confident of that point? Uh, through the chair, we're confident they have the technology, but it hasn't been tested yet on a, on a sort of a, a project like this. So I think testing it's a, an important first step with a, with a pilot project like these. Right, okay. Um, and the second thing was I, 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 um, I, I wondered whether it was possible or whether you're aware of this happening anywhere where suburbs were actually given or we published, not individual households, or even individual streets, but potentially household uh, suburbs in terms of how much is going to landfill, and potentially then trying to work with them to reduce it by a certain percentage. With actual that data being given back to to the community, Are we is there any example of that around, and could that work? Uh, through the chair, um, there are examples of waste data being given back to residents um, in other parts of the world with some success. Yeah. Um, so if the trial of the uh, technology is successful in the projects that, that are discussed in this report, it's certainly something that could be explored in the future. Okay, perhaps you'll let me know when we got to that point. No worries. So that being the case, I, I would like to uh, move the officer's recommendation. I think um, certainly um, the uh, targeting the organics in the, in the red bin is a, is a major play. It's not just financial, it's uh, um, it's you know talking about I know they're out of date but it, they're probably not that wrong about 47% of, of the red bin being organics being food it's talked about here as a, as a contamination which is uh, I hadn't sort of looked at it like that previously but but that's true I guess um, and if we could be successful with um, getting greater community um, understanding of that and specifically um, as is as looked at here um, um, having a crack at people either not wasting it in the first place but if it is putting it in the right bin then um, you know there's there's financial and obviously environmental advantages to be to be had 
Um, the second one in regard to non-recyclable, also further down the pecking order, certainly, but, um, but yeah, I, I don't see any controversy around that either. So I'm, uh, I, I like the report. I, I asked for the first one particularly to be looked at. I think that is, that is a good crack. We, we put that technology in. I don't know, when did we buy the bins? Sorry, that's not the question. The, um, six years ago, we put that technology in. I think we can be a leader in using it and, and actually making a real, real change. So um, um, I'm happy with the recommendation. Thanks. Councillor Davis. I think it's a, a very good initiative. You're seconding? Can, yeah, okay. that's, yeah, I don't have a choice. Um, I think it's an excellent in initiative, and I think um, as a priority, this council should be to reduce the amount of green waste going to, to landfill, uh, especially if we are declaring a you know, climate emergency and things like that. That, to me, is one of the biggest single ways that people can have an impact um, on climate change is simply converting organic waste into um, carbon dioxide rather than methane. So I think if we can um, you know, use trials like this and we can actually explain to people what the effect is and how much of an impact you know, they're having, you know, their apartment buildings around the place which don't even have green bins, they don't even make an effort to, um, to reduce the amount of uh, organic waste that's going to landfill. Um, to me, that's the single biggest thing that any, any resident can do immediately, stop putting organic waste in their bin, produce more carbon and less methane. Um, and it's something, I think this will give us more data that we can actually um, go out to and monitor that, that progress. So, yeah, happy to support it. Councillor Hibb. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, yeah, I agree with you, Councillor Davis, um, and you, Councillor Pickett, and, you know, much of what... Um, <laughs> And uh, and uh, and much of um, what Philip has written in this report. Now I love I love reading Philip's reports because I generally learn something um, <laughs> about about the environment that I didn't know before. Um, look, I think both of these initiatives are fantastic. I think the organic and compostable material brings it up to over fifty percent. Um, tackling that is um, is certainly you know, worthwhile. We've got uh, we've got too much too much stuff going to landfill that shouldn't be there. Now that hurts our hip pocket um, with the you know the increased waste levy, and that's only going up exponentially. Um, and look, and the most interesting thing I learnt in this report, Philip, was that now I wrote this down that. Uh, Organics in landfill break down anaerobically, uh, whereas when they're in the specific um, organics, uh, you know, composting it's place, it's aerobically. Um, now this, of course, releases methane, and that I did not know. Now there's too many cows in the world, as it is, um, without us simulating their damaging ways down at Wingfield. Um, look, the benefits are there. Uh, we've got the tech, we've got the money put aside for it. Let's take this for a spin. Let's do this. Like it's been mentioned before, we have declared an emergency in terms of the state of our climate. These are the sorts of projects we need to be doing. So I hope this gets up and gets up quick. Councillor Cup. Thank you, Worship. Uh, a couple of questions somewhat related to this report. Okay, I've been waiting for the opportunity, so I think this is probably the one to raise it. Um, now, if we can just jump ahead, okay, and we get, we do the trial, results come back, and it says, you know, we're doing okay, right? I know East Waste are doing their part for, you know, awareness programs and so forth. Do we have any money set aside to run any sort of marketing campaign to encourage people to do the right thing? Maybe they don't know, know what they're doing. Maybe it could, it could just be uh, one of those sort of things. But do we have anything set aside, any money set aside to run anything? Uh, through the chair, there are two um, methods by which waste education uh, will potentially be funded in the future. The first is one that's already in place, and that is through East Waste. There is a, a budget set aside there that they use for waste education. Us. How much? We, yes. Well, yeah. I, well, that money is paid by yeah. the council. Yeah. yeah. And the second one is that it will be through the, um, the environmental sustainability strategy and action planning for that. Um, and there also has been a, um, a budget.
charge and pit put forward um, in the current round as well. I'll ask a, a supplementary question if I can. I was uh, in the Norwood Council the other day and uh, they had an, uh, an event and they were handing out these. And I think these are fantastic because the current bins, even though that sort of tells you what you can and can't throw in there, mine's all faded and you can't read it anyway because it's six years old now. Now, are we going to do anything as a council to hand these out? Uh, through the chair, we, we do have them available at the Civic Centre and we have promoted that through social media. We also have handed them out at, um, at events like the um, Community Fair, which was the um, at Garrett Glenunga Hub, Garrett, Garrett Sale Trump, thank you, um, last year. Um, but research shows that having direct contact with people um, that's, that's focused on their particular situation, so the bin tagging idea or the um, door knocking idea, is a lot more effective than providing things like stickers. So that's why the, the effort in um, the suggested in this report is focused in that direction. The things like the stickers are important reminders, and so it's handy to have them available, but really the, the most effective uh, means of changing people's behaviour is through contact with that person that's, that's focused around their own use of their bins. So either a discussion or some feedback on what's in their bins. Councillor Turnbull, uh, sorry, Councillor Hughes. I also thought it was a very good report. Um, I think one of the key things here is around getting people on board and that education piece and, as you said, that personal communication. I think the fact that we have this technology available um, within our bins and aren't using it as well as we could be is certainly an opportunity. Um, I see things like smart technology with smart water meters in the water industry where people can log in and see their individual house and their water usage and then compare their usage to their street's usage then compared to their neighbourhood's usage. And once you have a feel of where you sit within the community, it puts a bit of pressure on you <laughs> as an individual to think about what can I do. Um, and then perhaps something that we could even take it that ne next step further is I put one bag of rubbish in my red bin most weeks. Sometimes I don't put it out at all. And if you've got this technology that you know how much waste individual houses are sending out to landfill, you could be charging the user by the amount of rubbish that each individual house is sending out to waste. And I think that would be a really big incentive <laughs> to make people reduce what's going to landfill. So I think um, this is a really good step in the right direction in terms of using the technology that we have um, available and making the most of it. So I look forward to see where this goes, perhaps not to the extreme that I'm suggesting, but I think it's an opportunity. Now, Councillor Tim. Oh, thank you, Mayor. Um, I noticed that you have the door stopping by the contractors and you're going to put them in a certain area. Last year, I raised the idea to administration, can I, Barry, about delivering a pamphlet, you know, bright, easy, diagrams, etc. Not, not this one with the brown jumper, a different one, um, <laughs> to each household in the Burnside ward and my extremely fit co-counsellor and myself, and actually my husband, were going to do it. Is it possible that we could still do it? We're concentrating on the kitchen waste in compostable bags, one thing at a time. And we're going to go and put one in each of uh, the letter boxes because, well, the benefits are cost-saving, might meet some residents, keep fit, and get into practice for the next council election. <laughs> <laughs> So, I was wondering if we could do that, if we would be allowed to do that. Burnside Ward, doing it. There we go. Because we're straight into it then, and we can do it, get them done in the next couple of weeks. So, offline? Not that one. But like that? Similar. We would do it. Counts, do you want to answer that? Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Um, three, Madam Mayor. Yeah. Um, there's no reason why you can't. Um, I guess it would be good if one council decides to do it, but all councils. Um, but but um, if councillors wish to, I'd be happy to support that. I think what Phil said earlier is really true. When I went and spoke to a group in Glenside, they said, could somebody come and talk to this group of elderly residents? They said, could someone come and talk to us about how we can do it better? And that how, having someone to talk to 
how they can do it better is so much more powerful. I'm not criticising you what you're in intending to do, but if we could only collect more of those people together, and I think the other thing is the issue of we are increasingly got people in the community who don't speak English very well. The people who are going off to work may speak English very well, but the people who are staying at home who are doing the rubbish emptying don't. And I think we've increasingly got that issue in our community um, and that needs to be looked at as well. So just doing it in English is not good enough. Visuals, you know, websites with videos on are always the stuff that you used to have in the foyer running, showing people when they came in to pay their rates, etc. Those kind of things are very much more useful and practical. But it's identifying the targets. I still think the use of this technology is brilliant. So I'm now going to go to Councillor Henschke. Oh, thank you, Mayor. Yeah, thank you. I just want to clarify the costs to this council. The total cost was at 80,000. If I got that, I don't recall. And, and also, are we paying a part of a share of a bigger project cost? A big trial project? Through the chair, there's 40,000 um, allocated for mm -hmm. this project um, in this financial year. And it's a project that we'll be collaborating with East Waste on. But we're paying for the cost of the door knocking and the door um, and the bin tagging. And why are we, why is the City of Burnside only involved in this trial? Uh, through the Chair, the um, other councils have trialled um, door knocking and um, bin tagging and we'll certainly be building on their experiences. We're doing it in a much more focused way though on the green organics uh, and getting those out of uh, red bins and into green bins. And why are we doing this when the city of Burnside is doing quite well. The residents and rate payers are, you know, it was 10%. Uh, I think I remember reading the report, the level of organics that get put, um, put into the red bin. It's actually, you know, it was reported in this report that it was, you know, we're doing very, very well. You know, congratulations, the residents of the city of Burnside. So I don't know why we're so focused on putting, having to spend $40,000 uh, on this waste waste trial. Yeah, through the chair, there is a figure of 10% in the report, but that's the contamination rate in yellow littered recycling bins. Um, so that's the, the focus of the um, uh, calling residents and talking to them about their recycling practices. Mm -hmm. um, the contamination of um, organic waste in red bins is around the 50% mark. So mm -hmm. it's, it's quite a lot of contamination and costs hundreds of thousands of dollars a year. Mm -hmm. And through the chair, another question was um, privacy. So how is that going to be managed? Yeah, through the chair, that none of the um, residents' details will be released in any way. So the um, um, data that is collected through the project so that we can report back on how the project is going will be presented in a way that is um, agglomerating information so that it's a, a whole lot of information about um, residents provided together rather than individual residents being reported on and the, ad the addresses of residents that are, that are part of the project won't be released. Oh good. And um, finally question and Councillor Davey has, uh, his pardon has raised this already and um, what came to my mind straight away in this report was wow this is what they do in Europe, this is a pay as you go, um, pay as you trash pro, you know, model for uh, rubbish and um, in such countries where they have these RFIDs on bins, they get charged by weight and your council rates are a lot lower so you don't um, see it as a new cost. So my question is, um, is are we at the beginning of a new pay-as-you-go pay, pay program and should we be upfront with the residents about this and if the East Waste have intentions in this direction in their strategies, I think we have to be very honest with our ratepayers and not go into trials and I'm very passionate about this, without knowing the full picture. Because it's very, um, I, I, I'm very concerned about the, the, us going into a trial where we don't know where this trial is going. Is this international, and it's a, it's East Waste is a conglomerate of multinational companies. And, um, sorry, not East Waste, um, the French company that um, interstate, Lyonnais, um, was uh, involved in waste in Australia and they do this work overseas, they use your RFIDs, so it's nothing new. Um, 
through the chair, there's, there's absolutely no intention of taking this to a point of um, user pays in terms of waste in bins. There are a number of issues with going down that sort of track mm -hmm. um, that we're not even considering not at this stage. Thank so you for clarifying that. It's for using yeah. the RFID technology to provide direct feedback to residents about the waste in their bins and working with the community to improve waste management and save council funds. Thank you. Now, Councillor Dawes. <coughs> oh, uh, thank you, and uh, I do thank uh, Councillor Turnbull because our ward is mainly mountain goat territory. <laughs> right? So I'll get up the top of Waddle Park, the top of Burnside. I even drop it into the Shahins up there, so that would be fantastic. <laughs> right now, this is always the problem, and I, I love the report. I continually get that if I put my rubbish bin out, others put contaminated rubbish in the bin and therefore I will get fined, which I don't like, which I think was kind of hinted in the media, um, or you know, my record, because you're keeping a, a record of how much I put in each bin, is affected. You know? So you know, what I'm seeking, because everybody wants to try and do the right thing, I do really believe that deep down. But is there a, a clever inventor or some smart technology that when you put it in your bin, there's somehow it, it locks it, right? If you've got some device, has anybody done that in the world? It goes out and then along comes these waste and they've got another little thing that opens it up. So only you have put that um, rubbish in the right bin, or not the rubbish, but the recyclable, whatever it is. Do you know if that's the case anywhere in the world? Uh, through the chair, there are technologies to do those sort of things, but, but I think we're a long way off a need for that sort of technology here. Now, there are some issues with uh, contamination caused by other people um, in residence bins, but they're actually quite minor in, on the overall, in the overall scheme of things. And um, one of the reasons for having conversations with residents is that those sort of issues can be talked about and, and ironed out rather than going in with a, a sort of a, a stick approach of punishing residents. And that way we can work with the community to improve waste management rather than having a uh, sort of a, a penalising approach. Yes, I don't agree with the penalising approach. And of course I've just got a lovely photo here from Councillor Carbone with a huge amount of plastic in one of the bins. But the issue really is not in private residences, it's in where you've got a lot of units there and uh, people put you know, rubbish in, out of people's bins and there were about five or six in a row and that sort of thing. So to me, that's a key for the future. I'm not, I'm not saying you've got a solution, but it, it would really help because who would have thought of smart technology 10 years ago? You know, we would have thought, what are you talking about? You know, so I, I do think that's something for the future. Councillor Cornish. Uh, thank you. Um, great report. Um, and Councillor Dawes just um, did raise a potential issue um, which you might have to um, put your minds to. Um, I'm certainly living in one of those unit blocks where we choose to use maybe one, be one bin for the five of us because we don't fill up, you know, and we don't want 15 bins um, on our property. Um, so we, we limit down the number. So um, who you send messages to um, in that and, and how you train them, uh, whether or not you collect everyone in, in a unit block, um, that might be the way to go. But just, you know, the, the unit blocks I certainly think are probably going to be where you might get some of your better sort of results too. Right, I have no one on the screen, so I think it went back to Councillor Piggott. So those are in favour? Those against? First, Councillor Davis. 13.9, page 177. Only file in plain be allowed. <laughs> so I might um, 
if council like to council administration would like to offer any uh, assistance, that would be uh, helpful to, to hone the motion. Um, but essentially, one and two are the same. Um, and point three, that the busking permit conditions um, be be varied such that the permits be issued on a monthly basis, item five be deleted, and that buskers may perform for a maximum of one hour from the location before being required to move at least 50 metres away from that location. That could probably be um, written better, but that's about as good as I got. Um, and I'm sure that they'll um, recraft uh, the current um, conditions on page 184. Happy for me to move that way. No, I want to get rid of item five. So item, maybe I'll walk through it. So um, I think the two young, the two young guys um, who came in today um, reminded me a lot of myself when I was six years old. When I was six, I used to, that was the most I've ever earned in my life. I used to earn $100 an hour playing a couple of lines from Jingle Bells at the local shopping centre. And I've never reached the pinnacle of my income earning um, since then. And I used that money to pay for gliding courses, but then I got air sick, and so it's big drama anyway. So, um, and I did that for, for quite some time, and I, and I really enjoyed it, um, just playing recorder. I was a lot cuter than I am now, um, and used to have a lot of fun doing it. Um, and it definitely gave me a lot of meaning to, to why I was learning an instrument, and I think that's flowed through, you know, to why I'm um, doing something different now. So I think busking in, in the city is a great um, thing that we should definitely support. Um, and having listened to the two young gentlemen um, today, they certainly said, you know, and I can definitely see the, the difficulties that they raised in terms of um, having to come back to council or fill out a form every single time that they want to perform. Um, I, I just don't see younger people, people doing that on a regular basis. And I think my father probably would have struggled to do that on every single time that I wanted to go out. Mm -hmm. Item five requires that permission be sought from a local owner um, wherever they wanted to go. And, and I think in terms of how we consider that, I mean, I can certainly see the benefit in why the administration suggested that control. Um, and I can certainly see that, you know, that, that could be a benefit, um, in, especially for, for the local cafe owner or whatever it is. Um, but I really only think that it's going to be applicable um, and it's only really going to be a problem if um, a busker goes out there to be a nuisance. And the type of person who goes out to be a busker, and we don't have many of them at all in the city of Burnside, Council um, and those two two young lads here, I think as well. I just don't see them um, going out and trying to make a nuisance of themselves and and disrupt their own ability to go and do it. And so I think generally, if buskers are, you know, close to a restaurant or targeting one particular place, then I then I think that item five can be dispensed with. Um, and they they made the point of then is how do you control it? So they had a permit system, I think in Norwood, where you have allocated time frames. And I do like that the the suggestion by them. Um, to create a more flexible approach where um, it's an hour in a location before being moved on. And I think that that gives them the flexibility. Um, I think it gives us the opportunity as the city of Burnside to encourage it and make the rules as easy as possible without inundating you know, a 12-year-old kid with a whole bunch of paperwork and um, requirements um, and then have to go, and go to a local business to get the petition signed or get permission from them every single time they want to bus. Um, I think is just too much to ask. So... In my view, we should adopt the suggestions made um, by the two deputies tonight. Um, and if it is a problem and if we are getting those complaints and we need to look at the variation of the rules, then we can have a look at that. But I think, um, as per the table in that report, a lot of other councils seem to do it this way, especially Adelaide City Council seem to do it this way. Um, and I certainly haven't heard of any problems um, in that regard, and I don't expect that there would be. So I hope that you can support the motion. Um, uh, with those variations to the agenda. Councillor Carbo, you wish to second? Thank you, Worship. Happy to, uh, to second Councillor Davis's motion, which I think is a first for me, so uh, I was very delighted to do that. Um, but uh, I was delighted with this report. Um, of course, this was one of those, you've all heard the story, but I'll remind you again that this was one of those spur-to-the-moment activities where, in fact, Her Worship and I were in Burnside Village on a weekday, I think it was like a Thursday or something, and there they were basking. And I tell you what, you know, you, you get used to it in Rundle Mall and you get used to it maybe on the parade or something, but it just felt, it was foreign, it was weird, but it was so good 
as well to see it in our local community. And when I saw it, I thought, you know what, this is exactly the sort of stuff that Burnside Council should be encouraging. Anything that promotes the culture, anything that promotes, you know, uh, anything fun and, and sexy and vibrant in our community, you know, we need to really get behind and embrace and encourage. The report um, has pointed out that we do have a lot of uh, groups in the, in the council area, so the supply is there. You know, we have a lot of people who, who are musicians and maybe they've never thought about performing in front of the, uh, the pool or they've never thought about from, um, busking in front of the, uh, the library and so forth, you know. And I think just having something on Facebook and the occasional thing, you know, on the, in, the, in the paper and so forth, just telling them, you know what, you can actually busk here. It might just, it might just be that, that, that thing that just sort of starts the whole thinking process about, you know, changing their mindset towards how they see Burnside and so forth. So... It's fantastic. We've got, the, we've got the supply. The demand is there. People were loving it at Burnside Village that day and you heard about how much money they were making and so forth. So I, send, I think it sends a nice, clear, loud message to every musician in the city of Burnside that, you know what, we're behind you and we're open for business. Councillor Hubel. This is a really exciting motion, um, particularly as something that has the potential to really engage youth in the city of Burnside, um, um, and thank you, Farley, for the report. Um, on point five, uh, look, I do I do support removing point five. Um, look, I think at the end of the day, yes, I don't think buskers are out to make a nuisance by and large, um, and I think look, the market forces are going to, you know, keep this sort of threat in line. I think if uh, a busker is annoying, they're not going to get any money. <laughs> you know, <laughs> they're going to have a very poor time of things. So I think that's going to look after itself. And uh, I look forward to hearing the soft sound of the saxophone more and more. Oh, these, these players will be soft. Councillor Cornish. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Just a question, if I could, because um, obviously we've significantly changed um, the proposed motion, um, and I note that the previous um, constraints regarding the liability and 300 permits, um, how does the going from an uh, event to event to a monthly permit, does that change um, the, the premiums of our insurance um, or considerations there? or? I don't think we're going to be inundated, but um, uh, although we might. But yeah, I was just wondering if you could answer those. Yeah, just Councillor Davis. Through the mayor, I don't think it'll make any difference, but I would like to actually take that on board and, and check and get back to you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor Dort. Thank you, Mayor. I, I was very impressed with Henry and Archie, I, I, I must say. My only query is that. I, I would like a review report within 12 months. I don't know whether it can be added to your motion, uh, Councillor Davis. I, I'm just looking for, like, we think this is going to go really, really well, right? Uh, but we're unsure, but we really hope, you know. So when that happens, I always think, OK, well, let's see how it goes in the first 12 months. We actually do say only 300 permits in the first 12 months. So we're kind of thinking, yeah, well, perhaps we might want to review it after 12 months and continue it. So I'm wondering if you want to add to your motion, and it's up to you. Yeah, I'm just looking for a report in 12 months' time, in January 2021, uh, a review report to tell us whether we continue it. February, or whatever it is. Thank you. Councillor Piggott. Question, if I may. Um, uh, one of the things that was raised by our deputies uh, was around the um, adult supervision, which we currently do require that based on page. Not sure, actually. But anyway, we do require that. Um, 
as it currently stands, is I mean that strikes me again as a fairly limiting. I can understand why, but I mean I'm, I've seen a lot of buskers clearly under 18 that don't have their mum or dad standing next to them. So the two tonight, I think, are good examples of it. So um, um, do I need to do an amendment to get that changed? Saying you don't. No, it, yeah, I know you. That's why I don't change. Yeah. Through the chair, I've got that as part of the conditions with the permit. It's not actually part of the motion, so I couldn't see a problem in amending that. And I think by having the under 18s parental sign off, I can amend that pretty easily, and that shouldn't be a problem. Right. So Mum has to agree to me doing it, but she doesn't have to stand over there while I'm doing Correct. it. Correct. Yeah. And but you don't need anything from me tonight to do that. You'll just do that, or no. do we need to list this as 3.4? You're going to change anything else we haven't mentioned? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and they must wear this hat. <laughs> it's got Barry's face on it. Uh, no, I would like to speak to it. So just to clarify, so we are going to change that. Yep. Okay. Um, yeah, I support this. I, I think that's that's good. I think it was really useful. They not only have a go at you, but I think the, the two that came in today um, actually did throw a lot of information in that, that really has informed where we've got to, which I think is the right spot, as opposed to what was what was in the in the report. Um, so I don't know how we saw that out in future, but that you know that was that was really good, and I think this this is a, a good spot to, to finish. And I'd just say on the public liability insurance, I, I just wonder whether it may help cheer up the insurers as well. Whether in what we do, we encourage people to have public liability insurance, because in actual fact, um, from a you know, I'm not sure what it costs to be a um, uh, to play a saxophone and get public liability insurance, and they may choose not to. And I'm I'm not making it compulsory, but I would say it's probably in their best interest, perhaps, to have it if it wasn't too expensive. On the fact that you know, if they do uh, do something with their saxophone that causes a head injury or whatever, that could be quite a major problem for them. So I would suggest that we we recommend that they have it, um, as opposed to um, compel them to. So. But yeah, no, it's good. Let's, uh, all right, Councillor Hubel says this is an exciting motion. Councillor Henschke. <coughs> thank you, Meg. A question, um, thank you for the report. Item five the, that we're referring to here, buskers are to receive a written report from owners, proprietors, etc. cetera. Um, why was that um, detailed there? And it looks like there's been a lot of work <laughs> in that um, condition. So can you give us some background, please? Um, doing the benchmarking with other councils, yeah. I was taking and looking at um, what different councils do, and mm. most councils actually have that, um, okay. I guess, caveat in yes. there that um, it does give businesses, I guess, a little bit more power yeah. to, to move along. Yep. Having said that, I think your item where you've got buskers can um, busk for an hour actually mitigates that a little bit as well. So where mm -hmm. Adelaide City actually are silent on that particular item, mm -hmm. they do have that caveat of everybody needs to move along after 30 minutes. Mm. Yes, and my other question is um, uh, the Adelaide City Council, you know, we, you can't compare apples with apples because we're talking about buskers in Arundel Mall and the setbacks um, are quite large from the front door of a business and so I'm envisaging and imagining that buskers in our city tend to, would have to busk on a footpath which is only a few metres wide, is that what would happen? That would be correct, yeah. unless they chose places like the Civic Centre Courtyard or the Swimming Pool, oh, that see. kind of thing, Hazel yeah. Park. Yeah. So do you think that we've, we've managed the risk of upsetting the owners? And should, do we need to, have they been consulted? Do we need to consult with the business owners on this? Do you recommend that? I think by having 3.3, I think that mitigates um, businesses being unhappy. If the businesses complain, we can certainly take that on board and look at other options. Okay. Um, uh, yeah. Thank you. I'm guessing that assuming there was a complaint from someone when the young people chose to renew their permit, that would be addressed with them anyway. Correct. Uh, Councillor Hughes, perhaps just maybe because it's after 10 o'clock now, but 3.3, the way I read this, 
is I could busk in one spot for an hour, move 50 metres, and then come back to that spot. Is that correct? Am I just getting us on a technicality here, like the way that reads? I can just flick between no my two spots there. if no one else is there. I'm correct. Happy with that. Okay. Just wanted to confirm that was the intent. In well, <laughs> Councillor <laughs> Jones. Uh, I have a question. My, my understanding is that Australians have a right to freedom of assembly. So if I want to stand in a spot and play my guitar for eight hours and I'm not causing a nuisance to anyone, what right does the council have to move me on? <laughs> noise, noise. <laughs> Through the, the chair, the answer to that's in our bylaws. So bylaw three in relation to local government land and bylaw four in relation to roads is that busking is an activity for which you need a permit. Um, uh, there are a number of things you can't do on a road without a, without a permit. This is just one of those. That's in our bylaws already, that you need a permit. Yeah, and so why do we need a motion to have a permit if we already have a permit? Yeah, I'm stepping on Farley's toes here, but I, I, I think uh, we're here because we're responding to a resolution from the council to bring this back. So this is now just the mechanism by which we would issue permits for busking. I reluctantly support it. I think it's <laughs> I think it's a grotesque infringement of individual liberty, but um, um, <laughs> if that's I suspect that you know I'm the only economic rationalist in this chamber. I'm the <laughs> only libertarian in this chamber, clearly. Um, it's disappointing um, that people have to have uh, a permit to exercise their constitutional freedoms in this country, but um, <laughs> it's uh, Councillor oh, thank you. Quickly, the fine. I'm really. I, I, I hope that when this is being rolled out, we're not going to be just getting out there with our great. Um, ranges and fine <laughs> straight away like people there's going to be a transition isn't there where there's you know people will become used to getting a permit and uh, we'll be educating people rather than just fining immediately correct um there's actually other platforms too that we can promote um busking and that kind of thing and and every council other than um city of campbelltown actually has the same process that buskers need to go through so i would hope that buskers would have that understanding. Councillor Davis. I would, I would love to see tomorrow's messenger say, motion to enable busking, constitutional, high court challenge, <laughs> question mark. <laughs> that would just be amazing. <laughs> I don't, this is not the first time that I've been, I've been, I've been attacked on a constitutional point <laughs> for busking. <laughs> Anyway, we can go into it, but um, I'd be happy to support any training for constitutional law for Councillor Jones. Councillor um, Davis. I think it's a great... I'll, I'll stick to it. Okay, I think it's a great... Are you finishing? Are you yeah, yeah, no, I'm back on track now. One, so. Yeah, yeah, but I get to speak again. Yes, you do. <laughs> it's just taking longer. Do I get my timer reset? Yeah, yeah. I, I think it's a great initiative. Um, I don't think that they... You know, unfortunately, I don't think that there will be a, a huge uptake. I don't think that there are, you know, the best locations within the city of Burnside to really make a lot of money. Um, but I really hope that that's not the case. And I think that um, it will really be um, private landowners who should be encouraged to um, allow busking. That's where, you know, in Burnside Village, that's where the money's going to be. Um, and so... You know, I, I don't think that this will be a huge um, detriment. I don't see a huge number of complaints, but I'm glad that we're at least um, signalling in this direction and, and hopefully we can encourage um, more of what um, the two guys you know, showed us before. Cheers. Those in favour? Ag against? Carried. Right, now we move to number 14. 14.1, uh, 14.2. 14.2.1, Eastern Health Authority Audit Committee meeting, recommendation. Thank you, Councillor Cornish, seconded by Councillor Hubel. All those in favour? Carried.
Uh, Era Water, recommendation 14.4.1. Councillor Hughes, seconded by Councillor Cornish. Those in favour? Carried. Mayor's report. Councillor Pickett. <laughs> <laughs> An absolute mental block for a second. A council, it must be the time of night. Um, Councillor Piggott, seconded by Councillor Jones. All those in favour? Thank you. Carried. Uh, reports of members, delegates and working parties. Anyone wish to add anything to what is already up on the screen and will be printed in our next council minutes? Councillor Henschke? Uh, yes, I'd, I'd like to add that I attend the Australia Day celebrations and also engaged with residents regarding the budget bits 2021. Thank you. Any further additions? Okay. Uh, there is no, there are no, there's no correspondence, no other business, no confidential items, and therefore I can close the meeting unless somebody has any other business, which I skipped over, sorry. Oh, okay. You might as well do it now and now the business. No, I, I, I want to work on it if you want. All right, that's fine. Next meeting then. In two weeks' time, you'll be able to do that. All right, so I will close the meeting at 10.07 p.m. Thank you very much.